a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Five bells. Stand by all stations. Attention, all districts. A five alarm fire. Five bells move in immediately. That's it. Let's go. Let's go. Fire fighters. <laughs> Presenting Firefighters, the true-to-life story of our unsung heroes who stand ready to ride by day or night against our most murderous enemy, the Demon of Fire. In just a minute, we'll go direct to the crest of Break Leg Hill, where Chief Cody and Tim Collins, rookie firemen, have just been reunited after Tim and his boy companions were believed lost in the forest fire. Tim has brought new orders from the district warden. But before we hear them, here's a message. Let's go, firefighters. Let's go to the ridge on the crest of Break Leg Hill, where Chief Cody and Ellery Collins, commanding a force of volunteer firefighters, have made a final stand in their effort to stop the raging forest fire before it can reach Upper Falls. Only a few minutes ago, you remember, the front line of flame reached the fire break, the strip of land the firefighters have plowed up as a defense. Well... This is the test, Ellery. If that flame crosses the fire break... We'll be done for. Upper Falls will be destroyed right down to the last woodshed. Great blazing blisters. Can anything stop that flame? It's, it's like a wave of flame rolling toward us up the hill. We may have to run for it, Chief. Get your men ready. No, oh, no. Hold on. Wait, Ellery. I think that fire is beginning to fall back. Yes. Yes, it is. It's dying down. We've stopped the fire. We've stopped it dead. We've won. You men... We've won! We've done it! We stopped the fire! And as the battle swings in favor of the exhausted, smoke-grimed volunteers on Break Lake Hill, the district warden of the Forest Service is fighting a battle of his own. Far down the hillside, hidden by smoke and battered by the hot winds that follow the course of the fire, the warden's patrol plane, a helicopter, hovers a few feet above the ground as he calls through the hatch. Start down the trail to the highway. Right, sir. Anything else? I'll be down to the highway to meet you. I want to see Ellery and tell him face to face what a fine job he's done. Uh-huh. Oh, and that 
reminds me. If we can find old Bob, I want to see him, too. Old Bob, sir? I don't know him. Of course, I'm just visiting at Upper Falls. I don't know all the men from the farm. Now, your cousin will know old Bob Cooper, or Corbett, something like that. Uh-huh. An old timer. Shabbiest man in Ellery's whole crew. Hey, look, Jimmy. Look, there's my pride down there. All right, heads up, all of you. We'll try to drift her into the hilltop. All right, now, you fellas, don't even wiggle. You ready for that rope rider, Cullen? Yes, Just a second the word. I'll be ready, sir. Never saw the wind current so bad. Steady, all. We're coming in. All right, back in your seats, kids. Give us room. Ready the ladder. Ready here. Open the hatch. Hatch is open. Grab that ladder and get down it before we drift away. All right, boys. Down you go. All right. Hurry it up. Before the wind blows us, clean off the ridge. Well done. Good work. I'll meet you in an hour. And an hour later, as the weary firefighters from the hilltop reached the highway at last, Chief Cody and Ellery Collins order them into the waiting truck. Well, great work, you men. Yes, go on home and rest. You've earned a night's sleep. Well, that's that. There go the men. Oh, what about us? Gosh, am I sleepy. Yeah, me too. I'm almost not even hungry. I'm so tired. Well, uh, we'll go home in the tank truck. The cab will hold us. Uh, come on, fellas. We're on the last lap. The truck is just around the bend. Well, come on, Pete. I can beat you. Oh, that's what you'll think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Too tired to eat, but look at him now. <laughs> I wish I had their energy. <laughs> oh, uh, Chief Cody. Hmm? That tank truck proved out today, all right. Yeah, not such a bad idea, was it, Ellery? Why, that truck has been rolling all day long, hauling in a thousand gallons of water every trip. That's what stopped the fire along the edge of the highway here. Plenty of water for the pumpers and the backpack extinguishers, too. You know something, Ellery? If you have any other oil trucks around the countryside, any size... Thousand gallons up to, oh, maybe as much as 5,000. I see what you're getting at. In case of emergency. Hey, now that is an idea. Yeah, see what I mean? Pump out the oil or whatever they carry. Pump in water for fighting fires. Have a whole fleet of tank trucks handy whenever you need them. And no more fires out of control for lack uh-oh, of... Uh-oh. Huh? Yeah, around the bend, there's the district warden waiting for us at the tank truck. You made your report to him, didn't you, Ellery? Oh, well, yes. Yes, I did. I, uh... The, uh, well... What, what is all this? I, uh, yes. You don't mean he wasn't satisfied after you stopped that fire dead in his track? Oh, no, no, no. The warden didn't exactly... Uh, hey, Chief, look at Ellery. Well, look at his face. Under all that soot, he's blushing like a sunset. Come on, Ellery. What What did the warden say? He must have threatened to pin a medal on you. Oh, can't you fellas leave a man alone? The warden just said we did a good job. Uh-huh. You mean you did? A first-rate job of firefighting. Well, I explained it was the other men, all you boys that did it, and... Uh, all right, oh. all right. Don't burn up out of plain modesty. <laughs> Quick, Chief, talk about something else. Well, then, uh, what about this old Bob the warden wants to see? Did you find him? Oh, that's right, Ellery. Did you get in touch with old Bob? There wasn't any man up on Break Leg Hill who answered to that name. No, not a sign of any old Bob. None of the boys ever heard of him. Uh, hi there, warden. Oh. You waiting for us? I knew you'd round him up for me, Ellery. Huh? I want to have a word with you, my friend. You had me fooled. Fooled you, warden? Who did? Old Bob here. Who, who me? You're speaking to me, warden? Oh, Chief, he... Oh, I get it. Chief, he thinks... Ellery, you're... didn't old Bob tell you? I picked him up at your farm way back in the morning. Gave him a lift in my plane right to the peak of old Break Lake. Oh, so that's how he got there ahead of us. Uh, uh, warden, before this goes too far... You know, this morning in the plane, you thought maybe you met me somewhere before? <laughs> Hanged if I can remember where, Bob, but what's the difference? Old-timer, you gave me the surprise of my life. Well, how was that, Warden? By the way, this old-timer took hold up there in the fire zone. Best oh. man in your whole crew, old Bob was. Hmm. Ellery, you'd think this man had been fighting fires all his life. Well, matter of fact, <laughs> Ellery. Huh? Look at uh, old Bob. He's blushing worse than you do. Well, now he knows what it feels like. Well, Warden, all I did was well a man does what he can. Old timer, I saw what you did. We need your kind in the Forest Service, Bob. I want you to join us. How about it? Hey, Colin Zellery, get me out of this. Warden, you remember the fire chief's convention a year ago? Well, of the city? Of course mm-hmm. I remember. The chief of the city department gave us some advice that... Uh, Bob, old timer, your, your name is... Crompton uh, Cabot, isn't it? No, it's Cody. You now remember why you met him? Cody? Bob? Chief Cody? Well, I'm happy to meet you again, Warden. 
Eight blazing blisters. I haven't had such a fine compliment since I joined the department. Chief Cody, <laughs> offering you a job in my district, I ought to kick myself right over Break Lake Hill and all the way back. Now, no, no, you can't back out. You offered me that post before witnesses. And when I retire, maybe I'll take you up on that offer. Will you shake hands on that, sir? You bet I will. Now, uh, you've made a bargain and you can't back out. <laughs> Naturally, Chief Cody is delighted at the praise conferred by the district warden, particularly as the warden had no suspicion of the true identity of this firefighter in the shabbiest of old clothes. But it's time now for the chief, with Tim Collins and young Jimmy, to return to the city, and a new turn in the career of Tim Collins, rookie firefighter. For this exciting new experience, listen to our next true-to-life episode of The Firefighters. In just a moment, Chief Bob Cody will tell you, boys and girls, how you can help the firefighters in your own town. But first, here's a message you ought to hear. And now, Chief Bob Cody with a special notice for the Firefighters Brigade. Chief Cody. Hello, boys and girls. This is your friend, Chief Cody, with an idea I hope you're going to like. I believe you want to protect your homes and families from fire. And I believe you can do it best if you know some of the most common causes of destructive fire. Now, I'm going to tell you some that we find most often to blame. Yes, I'm going to give you a list of hazards that are so common that firefighters know them by heart. So next time we get together, be sure and bring a pencil and paper, and we'll start writing down that list. Well, that's all for now, but you'll hear from me soon. Fire Chief Cody and the young rookie fireman Tim Collins will be back on the same station the next time you hear... That's it. Let's go! Say good words, the duck, which is up here, will fly down and give him a hundred dollars. The boy tonight is glad. Okay, duck, go lay an egg. Gentlemen, <laughs> who's up the bat? Well, Bracken, we invited some railroad men to the show tonight. You did. And uh, our audience selected Mr. You Ronald. Keep track of them, you The railroad men? <laughs> That's the tie that binds, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Roger, we invited some railroad men to our show tonight. Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Mr. Ronald Bryce to be on the show. His partner is Josefina Dean. She has an interesting occupation. Say the secret word and divide a hundred dollars. It's a common word, something you see every day. Let's see, Josefina Dean and Ronald Grease. Is that uh, approximately right? <laughs> My name's Josefina, but everybody calls me Fina. Oh, Fina. Well, Groucho, I have uh, some interesting information about uh, Miss Dean. You do? Well, yes. I wish uh, you'd it to me later, huh? Well, uh, right now I'd like to say that uh, Miss Dean becomes the 1600th contestant that we've had on the show. Really? Yes. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Give me five, huh? You don't win anything, but congratulations anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, now that we've passed that milestone, let's find out something about you two. Uh, Josephina, is that the way you pronounce it? Josefina. Oh, Josefina. Well, Fina is... I'll call you Fina. That's good. I don't call know what you... to call me that. I'll call you Fina, and you can call me Bobbito. <laughs> <laughs> if that doesn't put everybody to sleep, nothing will. <laughs> Where are you from, Fina? I'm from Laredo, Texas. Laredo, huh? Is that the in Nacogdoches? It's a city on the musical scale. Laredo, you know? Laredo, uh, is that, was it named deliberately uh, after a musician or something? I'm sure so. 
Tina, your face is very familiar. Haven't I met you someplace before? I processed your passport application last summer, remember? Oh, well, that's right. You, you remember me, too, huh? Surely. You ask more questions than anybody has ever asked in the passport department. <laughs> Why should you remember that? Doesn't everybody ask you questions? Yes, but the questions you asked had nothing to do with passports. <laughs> That's true, and your answers had nothing to do with my passport either. <laughs> I'll get back to you in a minute, Fiend. Right now, I'd like to talk to your partner. Ronald uh, Grease, huh? Where are you from, huh? Well, the Buckeye State. Ohio. Buckeye State. Oh, definitely. Are you married? Yes. Why do they call it the Buckeye State? And why are you married? <laughs> well, I'll have kind of a long story, but I'll cut that short. The Buckeyes, better, they, huh? they naturally raise Buckeyes back then. Why am I What married? is a Buckeye? <laughs> I believe that's a particular kind of a nut that grows on a tree. So well, let's keep personalities out of this. Yeah. <laughs> what is your job, uh, Ronald? Well, I'm a locomotive fireman. Oh. Well, a fireman on a big locomotive is one job I've never envied. Isn't that hard work? Shoveling coal all day into a hot furnace? Well, railroad firemen nowadays do not have to shovel coal. We burn oil. Shoveling oil is even tougher than shoveling coal. Well, well fortunately... Unless you're shoveling soft coal. <laughs> fortunately for us, where they have it piped up to where it goes in kind of automatically. You know, you turn the valve here, pull a lever. Oh, it comes out here, huh? Yeah, that's right. Much, much easier than uh, using the shovel. You must have a soft set, huh? Just turn the valve and your work's all done. You must have a lot of time to catch up on your reading, huh? Well, we're not allowed to read while on duty. No. Well, the next time you read, uh, see if you can find out what Buckeye is, huh? I'll do that. <laughs> well, uh, you're a nice couple, and I hope you win lots of money in the quiz tonight, uh, Tina. Now, uh, you select the general information quiz, and remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Now, what do you want to start with? Uh, we decide on 50. 50. Well, that's a nice... Uh, what city was buried in ashes when Vesuvius erupted in 79 A.D.? Talking over. And, uh, that was, uh, Evans Greece, a little bit before my time. Yeah. That was before my time, too, but it was Pompeii. Oh, sure. Well, you lost yeah. half your original hundred dollars. You still have fifty dollars. All right, now what are you going to try? The bigger they are, the harder they are. Well, we'll be down one degree. Forty. All right. Who uses a light meter and a filter in his profession? A photographer. That's right, Buckeye. A photographer. You now have ninety dollars. Now what are you going to try? The lady says sixty. Sixty. Who is the Spanish queen who financed Columbus's voyage to the New World? Isabel. Isabella is right. You now have one hundred and fifty dollars. And it's your last chance to be the other couples. What are you gonna go for? Okay, well we'll try to lose some money. A hundred. A hundred. On top of what famous Washington building is the Statue of Freedom? <coughs> it's a tough one, but it's a lot of money. Talk it over. <laughs> Uh, the Capitol building? That is right, the United States Capitol. Climb <laughs> up with two hundred fifty dollars. Buckeye, you were okay. okay. Next couple is ready and waiting, Groucho. They're Mrs. Edna Albright and Mr. Tom Sawyer. So, folks, you come in, please, to meet. Groucho Marx. Say the secret word and divide a hundred dollars. It's a common way, something you see every day. Mrs. Albright, I'll start with you. Do you mind if I call you Edna? Or do you want to be called Eden? No, just Edna. Edna, huh? Where are you from, Ed? From Scandia, Kansas. Scandia? I thought that was in Sweden. On the Sunset Strip. <laughs> now, Mrs. Sawyer, you're rather a large uh, party. Could you give us some idea of your size? Well, Groucho, I'm a little over six feet, and I tip the scales at 272 pounds. 
How old are you, Mr. Sawyer? Forty-seven. Forty-seven, huh? Where are you from uh, originally? Kankakee, Illinois. Oh, I played Kankakee. It's a nice town, wouldn't you say that? Well, a quaint town. Yes, it is. It's one of these towns where you're down the street in the morning, and instead of saying hello, the people say, Do you know? <laughs> you must have some very stimulating conversations. <laughs> Well, uh, could you illustrate what you mean? Pretend I'm walking down the street and you spot me now. How would the conversation go? Well, I'd see you. I'd say, hello, Groucho. Do you know that Farmer Jones just had a heifer? You're kidding. <laughs> Do you know I didn't even know he was married? <laughs> Is that all they do in Kankakee, have heifers? Well... Some of the people don't. They have children. <laughs> well, Eden, I'll, uh... Is that your name, Eden? Edna. Oh, Edna. Let's get some inside dope of right. you. Uh, what do you do for excitement, uh, Eddie? Raise roosters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew the minute you strutted in here, I said to my son, now, there's a rooster woman if I ever saw her. <laughs> well, how far off the ground do you raise roosters? <laughs> What's in there about roosters that you find uh, particularly interesting? Well, I've been breeding for intelligence. Um, You've been breeding roosters for intelligence? For intelligence, duty, uh, with a view to writing about it. And that's the time getting some books together. How many birds do you have at present? Uh... Well, I've got about 400 altogether. Where do you keep them? And what do you do with all the shoes and pots that come over the fence? Well, I have the hens and the rabbits and the ducks where I live, and I've had to move the roosters. Uh, That's not very handy for the hens, is it? <laughs> no, this is bad for roosters. Yeah. It changes their personality. Oh. <laughs> well, don't you think it should? <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Sawyer, let's leave Edna's other rooster and find out some more about you. <laughs> what sort of work do you do? I'm a freelance writer. Really? I'm glad we finally got back to the cultural level that we're accustomed to on this show. Do you write books? No, I write for magazines. What are some of the stories you've written? Maybe I've read them. Well, let's see. Bullets are leaking blood, and uh, vengeance rides a, a bloody trail, and murder points a bloody finger. You just write for children, eh? <laughs> Most people read them, I hope. Now, what name do you write under? Tom Sawyer? Well, most of them are Ned Carter, Lieutenant J.G. Black, Sylvia Sawyer, and Tom Sawyer. The last one I wrote, was published, was an article, Should the Girl Kiss Her Bow Goodnight? <laughs> this is the whole story? I don't have an article the name of it. I have an article about it. Oh, they should kiss the uh, boyfriend goodnight. And well, what was your opinion? What did you tell the girl? Oh, actually, not to kiss him goodnight. <laughs> you Benedict Arnold, you. <laughs> well, you're a nice, normal, everyday couple. Huh? <laughs> you're, you're my kind of people. <laughs> now, let's see how you can make out in the quiz. Are you you selected American history? That's, That's right. right. In the race for the $3,000, the first couple won $250. The secret word is glass. Remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Now, what do you want to start with? Remember your partners. Sounds agreed. $100 question. A hundred. Is that all right with you? Uh... Yeah. Whatever he says. Hey, Martha Dandridge Custis became the wife of what great American figure? George Washington. That is right. Huh? Well, you now have $200. All right, now what are you going to do? Well, we're going to write down the string. Ninety. Ninety. Okay, what was the first capital of the United States under the Constitution? Philadelphia. No, I'm sorry. It's New York. Oh. You should have asked Edna. She may have had some roosters in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, you lost half your 200. You now have $100. Okay, now what are you going to go for? $80. $80. Now, you ask Edna this time, too, because she may have some knowledge about these things. What was the name of the French nobleman who fought on our side during the Revolution? That's right, sir. Lafayette. Lafayette, we are here. You now have $180. It is your last chance to be the other couples. What are you going to go for? 
Thurmond. Seventy? Who was the first vice president of the United States? Adams. John Adams is correct. <laughs> We invited some military school boys to the program tonight, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected uh, Frank Luke to be on the show. His partner is a housewife, Mrs. Marie Haas. So, folks, you come in, please, and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, welcome to your best life. Say the secret word and divide a hundred dollars. It's a common word, something you find around the house. Howdy, howdy. Frank Luke, eh? Yes, sir. Uh, you're the youngest. I'll start with you. Where are you from, Frankie? From Military Academy, sir. You were born in the Military Academy? No, sir. How I... did you arrive? Were you shot out of a cannon? Like I was Park born Wheat? in San Diego, sir. Oh, oh San, San Diego. Diego. You know the chief of police down there? No, sir. Uh, how old are you, uh, Frankie? Sixteen, sir. Sixteen, huh? What is your rank in this academy? Are you a general? A captain, sir. Captain, sir. Well, you're a fine-looking lad. Now, if you just stand at parade rest for a minute, I'll talk to your partner here. Let's see now. Uh, you are Marie Hobbs, is that right? Call me Marie. I'll call you Marie. I'm delighted to have you call me Marie. Where's your home, Marie? Memphis, Tennessee, way down in Dixie. Well, that's mighty fine country around here. It certainly is. A lot of corn pone down there. Oh, you got ham hock and navy beans. Yes. <laughs> A ham hock, that's an actor that puts his watch in soak. <laughs> Marie, I'm not going to ask you how old you are because that'll be too crude, don't you oh, think I'll so? Oh, I'd be delighted to tell you my age and I'm proud of it. I'm 76 years old. Well, you don't look it. You look like a young lady. But I feel like I'm 16. You feel like you're 16? Yeah. Well, you look like you're about 18. What do you mean you feel like well, you're 16? Well, because I can do anything a 16-year-old girl can do. You can, eh? I can walk miles and I can climb a six-foot ladder and paint screens and cut the lawn and do anything. Can you eat three bananas? And I don't what? have any new writers or arthritis. I have a kind of itis like old women have. <laughs> I have no birds and veins because I have one account here showing my legs. Contest <laughs> very close veins? I haven't got any. Oh. Well, how did you win? Because I didn't have any. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know they had one like that. I wanted anyway, because I don't see I hadn't got you any got of You got a pretty nifty pair of gams. <laughs> I'm no bum me the other. Let's see yours. Oh, mine, be sure. Yeah, let's all, let's all look at it. Oh, much or so. Fifty-five long years. Fifty-five years. That yeah. strikes me something to be proud of. You bet it is. After a half a century with the same man, how do you feel about him, Marie? Oh, I love him just the same as I did the first day I met him. Well, answer my question. How do you feel about him? Yeah, all right. Well, it's wonderful. Two people can be married fifty-five years and still be in love. Mm-hmm. I'd like to get a look at this wonder man. Mr. Hobbs, will, would you please stand up? Sure. He's not here. He's, he lives in Tennessee, and I live here. That's why we stay married so long. Wonderful, because to be out, it breeds contempt and absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, of course, you can overdo that philosophy, too. Yeah. Well, Frank, uh, tell us something about your school. Uh, how do you dress at this place? Blue jeans and T-shirts hanging out like other high school boys? Not quite, sir. We're required to wear clean press pants, clean press shirt, and hair well combed, clean shaven, shoes shine, so the expecting officer can see his teeth in them. You're assuming that the officer has teeth, huh? They do. Huh? You have to be clean-shaven? Absolutely, sir. Well, my guess is that you let raise the people and not getting rich of your school. <laughs> Marie, what are your plans for the future? Do you have any in particular, like well, becoming a fan heart? 
Well, in order to keep the children from worrying or go to any expense, I made all my funeral arrangements. That's all paid for. You have your funeral all paid for? Yeah, the preacher and the organist and everything. Well, that's certainly an unusual way of looking at you, Demise. Well, it's a good you know, investment on your money. You get 4% if I live to be 105 years old. <laughs> How do you figure this out? Well, I get four percent. Well, we started taking it out twenty years ago. Just look, it wouldn't cost you anything to be buried. You mean you paid all this in advance? Oh, you bet. I'm going to get four percent today. Well, this will be the first funeral <laughs> arrangement in history where the undertaker is the one who goes in the hole. <laughs> intriguing couple, and I'd like to go on talking to you, but I imagine you're both more interested in getting rich. Aren't you, Marie? Oh, yes. So let's play your bet your life. If you win any money here tonight, are you going to send any to your husband? No, I think I'll give it to the most of it to the heart fund. Oh, I see. Well, that's a very worthy place to throw in. Now, we start you off with $100, and if you miss a question, you lose half your bankroll, no matter what it amounts to at the time. Is that clear? First two couples are tied with $250. Now, you selected capitals of foreign countries. And remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Now, what do you want to start with? 10, 50, 80, 100. Anything oh, you want? 60? Yeah. All right, what is the capital? Uh, $60, you say. What is the capital of Brazil? Talk it over. When it's ours. No, I'm sorry. It's Rio de Janeiro. Now, in the next question, you ask Marie. Well, it's possible that she may know an answer, too. It may not be the correct answer, but she may know it. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, give her a fighting chance, right? You lost half your original hundred dollars, you now have fifty dollars. Well, let's take, uh, what was she saying, sixty? Yes, you had sixty. Sixty, yeah. sixty. What do you want, fifty? All right, mm -hmm. what is the capital of the Republic of Ireland? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a guess. Dublin. Dublin is right. Dublin. <laughs> you just got in under the wire, friend. You now have $100 again. Okay, <laughs> now what are you going to go for? Easy ones? A little. Hard ones or tough? 40? What is the capital of Egypt? Cairo. Cairo is right. <laughs> now I have $140. Are you fighting with Marie, yes, George? Yes, I am. Oh, well, I'd like to fight with you, because you're good-looking, too. Like <laughs> that, too. He fights with everybody, Marie. Well, that's nice. Can't trust him at all. Well, my husband ain't here in the field. I heard he was away, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's more encouragement than Fenneman's had in many months. <laughs> all right, here's your last chance to beat the other couples. What are you going to go for? Big one or little? Lady. Lady? Okay, what is the capital of Spain? Madrid. Madrid is right. You wind up with one hundred seventy dollars. You did fine, Marie. Tied for a chance at the big question. We'll uh, have each of them write their answer down on the cards we've given them, and if both couples get it correct, they will divide the money between them. You all set? You have 15 seconds. You have here we go. For $3,000, I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully, and please note up in the audience. One of the most widely publicized incidents of World War II occurred when the Marines raised the American flag on a mountain on Iwo Jima. For $3,000, what is the widely publicized name of the mountain? on Emo Jima, where the flag was raised. All right, give me the card. Well, write something now. Nothing? No, they have nothing now. 
Well, I'm uh, Edna Albright, and Tom Sawyer's answer is Mount Sorabachi, and they went three thousand dollars. <laughs> thousand uh, dollars. What are you going to do with all that money, George? Well, What's the additional money that you want in the quiz? Most of it is going to surprise and knock dead some long waiting, long suffering creditors. <laughs> well, I hope they get their money. They will. They were very patient, according to you. They certainly were. And uh, how about you, uh, Penny? The Benny, same huh? thing. Ditto. <laughs> You owe the same the same people that he owes? Huh? <laughs> no. Probably a lot worse. Goodwin, speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap that cures fine cast eel. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, our guests, lovely Hetty Lamar, Jimmy Cash, and Felix Mills and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, it's afternoon, and George is just getting home from the office. As he opens the front door, he hears Gracie on the telephone talking to Pat O'Brien. Oh, no, 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 Pat. Tim Hohen married Katie McDonald. It was Muscles Malone who married Fatso Finnegan's sister. Oh, no, not again. Oh, hello, George. Pat, George just came in. Huh? Oh, wait a minute, I'll ask him. George, how's the juggling game? <laughs> you tell that Irishman I'm not a juggler. Oh, of course. Pat, George isn't a juggler. He's a comedian. Sure. Well, wait. I'll have him tell you that joke about the moron who flooded the football field so the coach could send him in as a sub. <laughs> Here, George. Tell Pat that joke. Hang up. Hang up. Oh, hello, Pat. Well, I'd better hang up. George isn't his usual comical self today. Goodbye. That guy has got everybody in town thinking I'm a juggler. Can't he get it through that head of his oh, that I'm not now, a... Oh, George, don't be upset. I have some good news for you. What? Well, look. Tomorrow is Navy Day, and what do you think is going to happen to Tootsie Bagwell? Very little, if I know our Navy. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're wrong. There, there's a big contest to choose the Queen of the Fleet, and the sailors are going to elect Tootsie. Gracie, the boys would rather kiss a duffel bag. <laughs> she hasn't got a chance. Oh, is that so? Well, it just happens that Tootsie is in second place. Really? How many girls in the contest? Two. <laughs> I see, and Tootsie's in second place. Yes. And uh, who's in first place, Monty Woolley? Oh, no. Tootsie, it's a girl. Is she the same type as Tootsie? Hmm? The Teddy Lamar. <laughs> Teddy Lamar? Yes. All the other girls dropped out of the contest when they heard that Hetty was in it, but Tootsie's not afraid of her. <laughs> she's, she's giving Hetty a terrific battle. How does it stand? Well, Hetty has 2,617,000 votes. And how many votes has Tootsie? Three. <laughs> That's a close race. Uh, uh, how did she get the three votes? She has four brothers in the Navy. <laughs> four brothers and she's got three votes? Well, one of them has seen Hattie Lamar. <laughs> Look, Gracie, Tootsie hasn't got a chance. Why don't you forget this silly thing? Oh, because I'm not a quitter. It's like I told the newspaper reporters, and you'll be proud of this, George. I said... Mrs. George Burns is always for the underdog, no matter how homely other people may think they are. If she weren't, she wouldn't be Mrs. George Burns. <laughs> I'm proud, proud. And besides, George, it would mean so much to Tootsie's father if she could be elected queen of the fleet. 
Tootsie's father? Yeah, he's captain of the SS Dauntless. Uh, battleship? No. Cruiser? Mm, no. Destroyer? No, well, you're getting warm. Well, what is it? A garbage scow. <laughs> garbage scow. Well, that's practically a destroyer. <laughs> Longer than that. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll see you girls later. I'm going down to the cigar store. Oh, aren't you, Fidel Tootsie? When you become queen of the fleet, you can have your pick of any sailor. Yes. If I do get a husband, Papa says he'll marry me on his boat, the SS Dauntless. Oh, that would be wonderful. You could not only have orange blossoms, but the peelings, too. <laughs> Hello, Gracie. Hi, Tootsie. Hello, Bill. Oh, Bill. Have you heard the news? Tootsie may become Queen of the Fleet. Queen of the Fleet? Yes, the Navy's taking a poll. Well, they are if they take Tootsie. <laughs> well, Bill, the, the contest is narrowed down to Tootsie and Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar? Uh huh. Oh, brother, there is a beautiful woman. You know, I see her out at MGM every day. She's making a picture called The Heavenly Body. The Heavenly Body? Oh, it must be about the moon or the planet. <laughs> Silly girl. Oh, Bill, if I get to be queen of the fleet, all the sailors will want to marry me, but uh, if you'd like to get in your bid now... Yes, Bill, Tootsie, you'd rather have a bird's hand. Would you, Tootsie? Oh, yes. Well, okay, here. Oh, what's that? A bar of swan. Now you got a bird in the hand. <laughs> You're a wise girl, Tootsie. Swan, the new white floating soap, is four soaps in one. The soap for your hands and face, for bathing the baby, for washing the dishes, and for doing your light laundry. Four swell soaps in one. Oh, Bill, what I meant was I'd love to marry a sailor, but I'd rather marry a radio announcer. Oh, well, what are we waiting for, Tootsie? You mean... Sure, let's go speak to Harlow Wilcox. <laughs> oh, Tootsie would prefer a husband who sells swan soap. Yes. Must get an understudy. Another man who can remind folks that swan is great for dishes because it gives so much suds so fast. Someone who knows that swan is so mild and gentle it doesn't give your hands that rough red dish panty look. Well, it's no use, Tootsie. Bill wouldn't marry you unless you came in a cool green wrapper with a white swan on the front. <laughs> That's right. And if you were a great wartime buy like swan. Oh, come on, Tootsie. If you're going to win this election... You have to contact over two million sailors between now and midnight. Do you think you can do it? It'll be fun trying. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute, girls. You're not serious, are you? Why, the only way Tootsie could win would be for Hetty Lamar to withdraw. Say, I never thought of that. I'll go right over and talk to Hetty. Oh, don't do that, Gracie. No? No. <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> Oh, Bill, I wouldn't even take you along with me. I want to talk business with Hetty, and you'd only interfere. Oh, Gracie, I promise you I'll just sit there on her lap as quiet as a mouse. <laughs> you mean you'd be satisfied just to sit on Hetty Lamar's lap and hug her and kiss her and not say a word to sure. her? Oh, well, no, you certainly can't go. I don't want her to think my friends are unsociable. <laughs> Our popular young tenor, Jimmy Cash, and a new popular ballad, My Heart Tells Me. James? Sometimes I feel so very certain that you care, and there are times I feel we don't belong. The more I fall for you, the more I must beware. So how am I to know? I am right or wrong For my heart tells me this is just a fling Yet you say our love means everything Do you mean what you are saying? Yeah. 
kiss like yours could lie again. If I'm poor enough to see this through, will I be sorry if I do? Tracy is just arriving at Hetty Lamar's house to try to persuade her to withdraw from the Queen of the Fleet contest in favor of Tootsie Sagwell. Yes? Oh, how do you do, Miss Lamar? <laughs> Won't you come in, Miss Allen? Oh, thank you. Oh, but let's not be so formal. You call me Gracie and I'll call you Hetty. All right, Gracie. Ah, that's better. After all, we probably have a great many things in common beside our beauty. <laughs> well, uh, what did you want to see me about, Gracie? Well, Hetty, I'm going to be concise and to the point. No beating around the bush. Strictly business. I have a girlfriend. My, that's a lovely dress, isn't you? Yes. You like it? Oh, I think it's charming. Uh, my dress is new, too. Really? <laughs> it's stunning. Isn't it, though? Well... I'm going to be concise and to the point, Hetty. You see, this girl... My hat is new, too. You don't say. It's simply beautiful. Oh, no. Do you really think so? Yes. Oh, so do I. <laughs> and you know, this hat was my own idea. Oh, you designed it? No, but it was my idea to buy it. How <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, what was it you wanted to say? Oh, well, I'm going to be concise and to the point. You're in a contest to... Say, do you have your hair done at Dorothy's? Why, yes. You know, I thought I saw you coming out of there the other day. She does my hair, too. Gorgeous, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, flatterer. <laughs> Gracie, you had something to say to me. Oh, yes. Well, Hetty, I'm going to be concise and to the point. How much do you want to bet? <laughs> oh, I am. Now, my girlfriend... Oh, my, those are lovely stockings you have on. Thank you. I'll send you a bottle of them. Uh, I wish you would. Uh, you know, I just hate wearing Bobby socks. They make me feel even younger than I look, if such a thing is possible. Gracie, you said you had something to say to me. Oh, oh yes, I have, and it's terribly important. Well, what is it? Hey, I'm going to be concise and to the point. Oh, no. Now, this time, please beat around the bush. Oh, no, no, I'm so businesslike. Hetty, I want you to withdraw from the Queen of the Fleet contest. Withdraw? But why? The boys on every ship voted for me. Well, not all of them. Haven't you heard about the Tootsie Sagwell vote? The Tootsie Sagwell? Is that an American ship? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Tootsie's my girlfriend. She's your rival in the contest. Oh. Now, Hetty, please do me a favor. Come over to my house and talk to Tootsie. Well, all right, Gracie, if you want me to. Oh, good. One look at her and you'll know you haven't got a chance. <laughs> Tootsie, I brought Miss Lamar back with me to show her why she might as well give up. Hetty, this is Tootsie Sagwell. How do you do? Oh, Miss Lamar, I'm so sorry we have to be rivals. I've always been crazy about you. Oh, you're very kind, Miss Sagwell. Oh, oh your love scenes are wonderful. Uh, tell me, how does it feel when Charles Boyer puts his face close to yours and whispers in your ear? You really want to know? Yes. <laughs> it tickles a little. <laughs> Now that you've seen Tootsie, don't you agree that it's silly for you to stay in the race? No, Gracie. I believe I still have a chance. But Tootsie is the ideal queen of the fleet. Aren't sailors very manly? Of course they are. Well, Tootsie's type of beauty is much manlier than yours. <laughs> Gracie, the sailors all voted for me. I know, and I can't understand it. Here, stand up side by side and let me compare you two. All right. Very well. Uh-huh. Just as I thought. There's no difference in your faces. Your eyes and ears and 
nose and mouth are the same. Really? Yeah, I counted them very carefully. <laughs> Now, why should we argue, Hetty? Just drop out and let Tootsie be queen of the fleet. I'm sorry, Gracie. I'd step aside for Miss Agwell if the honor wasn't such a great one. Oh, I don't blame her, Gracie. I'll just tell Daddy that I lost. Yes. Oh, yes, your father. Oh, the poor old captain. Hetty, would you want to break an old man's heart? Why, no. But you will if Tootsie doesn't win. It'll be the end of Captain Sagwell. The most gallant old sailor whose timbers ever shivered. <laughs> Your father, Tootsie? Yes, he's captain of the SS Dauntless. Oh, is that a famous ship? Oh, very famous. When the Dauntless sails up the river, people for miles around know that it's coming. <laughs> oh, especially on a windy day. <laughs> but why am I breaking his heart? Oh, because Tootsie is all the poor old salt has left. Before she was born, he hoped that she'd be a young salt. And he was very sad when she turned out to be a saltine. I see. <laughs> he, he still tries to make her part of the daisy. To this very day, he calls her bedroom the crow's nest. <laughs> Gracie, that's a very touching story. Yeah, I thought so, too. Oh, be kind to Captain Sagwell, Hetty. The poor old man is all shot to pieces. Oh, too bad. In what battle was he wounded? What... Battle? Well, uh, uh, name one. Well, uh, the Battle of Manila. Well, that's amazing. You guessed it the very first time. <laughs> oh, please, Hetty, won't you let his daughter be queen of the fleet? Well, I could see him and talk to him. Oh, well, no, you better not. He's pretty weak and old. Yes, Daddy's very feeble these days. Wait, I see your father now coming up the walk. My father? He must be. I noticed the family resemblance. Uh, but, Hetty... Here he is, fumbling at the door. Hello, Dan. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> Say, isn't this Hetty Lamar? Yes, I'm Hetty Lamar. Here, let me help you to a chair. <laughs> help me to a chair? Yes. Gracie tells me you're shot. I am not. I'm a sober as a judge. Oh, John, I want to see you again. Felix Mills and his orchestra with a special Mills version of one of the season's cleverest songs. They're either too young or too old. Why did you rush me into the den? 
like to talk to Hetty Lamar. Well, George, you see, um, well, Hetty liked to try a dress I was wearing, and she wanted to try it on. Oh. Uh, and naturally, you wouldn't want to be there where she's trying on a dress, would you? Would you? George, get that silly grin off your face. <laughs> Okay, honey, I'll stay here. Oh, good. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. Hetty. Yes, Gracie? Well, now that you've seen Captain Sagwell, are you going to withdraw from the contest and let Tootsie be queen of the fleet? Well, I don't know, Gracie. It's such a great honor. Oh, but the men in the service have honored you lots of times, and it's only happened to Tootsie once. How did they honor her? Well, the boys in the army chose Tootsie as the girl they'd most like to snuggle up to their sergeant. <laughs> Excuse me, Hetty. Hi, Gracie. Well, what's wrong? You look worried. Oh, I am, Bill. Look, could you do anything with Hetty Lamar? Well, <laughs> I could certainly try. Well, she's in there. Go in and persuade her to let Tootsie be queen of the fleet. You leave it to me, Gracie. Yes? Uh, I'm, um, Bill Goodwin. <laughs> yes, I've heard of you. Oh, <laughs> good. No, not so good. <laughs> well, I suppose you've heard that I'm the sort of fellow who wants to sit on the sofa with a girl as soon as he meets her. That's exactly what I've heard. Well, it's not true. Here, let's sit on the sofa and I'll prove it to you. <laughs> What did you wish to see me about, Mr. Goodwin? Well, uh, Miss Lamar, you'd better move closer if you want to hear me. I can't talk very loud. There's a, <clears throat> there's a frog in my throat. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, uh, why not? There's also a wolf in your eye. <laughs> well, <laughs> here we are. Um, Gracie sent me in to talk about Tootsie Sagwell, but mm -hmm. I've got a better idea. Uh, Guess what it is. I suppose you talk about swarm soap. Oh, Hetty, are you kidding? Me alone with Hetty Lamar and I talk about swan, the new white floating soap? <laughs> Listen, would I waste my time telling you that swan is four pure soaps in one, the soap for your dishes, your light laundry for bathing the baby or for your hands and face, four swell soaps in one and pure as fine castiles? You bet I wouldn't. I'm no fool. Oh, of course not. You said it. Why, this is the chance of a lifetime. This is the time to talk about your your gorgeous hair, your lovely lips, your delicate skin. The kind that Swan would be great for. <laughs> swan is so mild and gentle. Why, doctors recommend Swan for bathing the baby. It's kind even to a baby's tender skin. Me talk about Swan at a time like this. Ha! Ha! <laughs> How can I think of soap when we're, we're sitting here as close together as the two halves of a bar of Swan? Which, by the way, you can break in two and use half in the kitchen for dishes and light laundry and half in the bathroom for your tub or shower. How could I do that? Yes, how could you? Well, Hetty, I just couldn't. If I talked about Swan now, I'd be the biggest sap in the United States. But I'm not. I'm... I'm... What? I'm the biggest sap in the United States. <laughs> Goodbye, Hetty. Hetty, did Bill persuade you to drop out of the contest? No, Gracie. In fact, the only person who has moved me at all is that poor old man, Captain Sagwell. Oh, yes, Tootsie's father. Hetty, for his sake, won't you give Tootsie your 2,617,000 votes? Well, uh, I'll go in and talk to him again. No, 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 no. No, you, you can't do that. Why not? Well, um, uh, he's taking the bath. I'll go in. You'll go in. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, well, he, um... <laughs> He, he bathed with his clothes on. You, you know how the laundries are nowadays. Uh, you, you stay here. I'll get him. Uh, George, it, it's such a lovely day. Get out of the house quick. Huh? It's too beautiful to sit indoors. Go to a movie. But, Gracie, what... George, you know what a different man you used to be after seeing Clark Gable in a picture. I was? Yes. They're reviving a Clark Gable picture of the Bijou. Why did you go down and get revived, too? <laughs> honestly, Gracie, I think you're trying to get rid of me. Well, uh, honestly, I am, George. 
Look, but I'd like to talk to Hetty Lamar. Oh, wait, George, wait. I'll tell you the real reason I want you to leave. Why? Hetty Lamar has fallen madly in love with you. That's silly. I know, but she has anyhow. <laughs> Hetty Lamar in love. Oh, stop. It's true, George, and I'm afraid I might lose you. This is ridiculous. Hetty Lamar's only seen me once. Now, if, if she'd seen me a couple of times, I could understand it. <laughs> George, please leave. It's dangerous for you and Hetty to be in this house together. Any moment now, the spark may leap into a flame and burn our marriage to the ground. Oh, there are the firemen now. <laughs> That's the telephone. Oh. Oh, hello. Oh, well, hold on to the phone a minute, let's say, George, sneak out of the house and don't let Hetty Lamar see you. Oh, all right. Uh, just a moment. I want to see you. Uh, you do? Yes. <laughs> I've been thinking this thing over, and there's only one thing for me to do. Give in. <laughs> you, uh, you think so? <laughs> oh, you brave man. When I think of what you've been through, I could kiss you. Oh, Really, Hetty, I... Come home with me. I've got 2,617,000, and you can have them all. <laughs> Gee, that's a lot. That's all I've got. Oh, don't, don't apologize. <laughs> Will you come home with me right now? Look, I'm very happily married. Well, what difference does that make? No, please, let go of my sleeve. But it's got to be now. Tomorrow it'll be all over. So soon? <laughs> of course. Tomorrow is Navy Day. <laughs> Hetty, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of every bullet hole in that poor little chest of yours. <laughs> bullet hole? Yes, I heard all about it from your daughter. My daughter? Yes, and don't worry. She'll be queen of the fleet, Captain Sagwell. Captain who? Captain Sagwell. Aren't you Captain Sagwell? Of course not. I'm George Burns. George Burns the juggler? Juggler? <laughs> What's going on? Gracie, come out here. Uh, did you call me Captain Sagwell? Stop with that Captain Sagwell. <laughs> Hattie knows who I am. <laughs> I'm afraid your game's up, Gracie. Tootsie won't be queen of the fleet. All those poor sailors. Well, I tried. Gracie, just what did you tell Hetty Lamar about me? Well, I told her you were a feeble, old, broken-down sea captain. Now tell her the truth. Hetty. Yes? He's not a sea captain. <laughs> Well, George and Gracie will be right back. Meanwhile, I'd like to remind you not to waste soap. Wasting soap is unpatriotic, you know, because soap is made of essential materials for the war front and the home front. So don't leave the soap in the water when you're bathing or washing dishes or duds or baby. And don't whip up more suds than you need. Keep soap dishes dry, too, because a wet soap dish dissolves soap and wastes it. And make soap jelly out of soap slivers. Well, that's the story, friends. Avoid wasting soap and do one more thing to help wash up the axes. And now here they are again, America's happiest Mr. and Mrs., George and Gracie. Oh, now, George. George, don't be angry. I only did it because tomorrow was Navy Day, and I wanted to do something nice for the Navy. But nothing good ever comes out of these silly ideas of yours. Well, something did this time. We've been invited to go on a three-day cruise. Really? On a battleship? No, on the SS Dauntless. Oh, the garbage dump. <laughs> Swan, the new white floating soap. Join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in to your Columbia station again next week, same time, when we'll have as our guest, Jack Benny. Remember, George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS, next Tuesday night. And now till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, well, I, Swan, how about you? Good night, everybody. <laughs> Amos and Andy.
As we go over to the home of the George Kingfish Stevens, we find that they're having a very trying day. Sapphire is trying to get some money from her husband, and the Kingfish is trying to discourage it. It seems that Sapphire is sadly in need of new clothes. George, I've got to have some new clothes. Yeah, well, stop being extravagant. Do you realize they're here just on clothes alone you spent $11? <laughs> $11? When I walk into a meeting at the women's auxiliary, I'm ashamed. I'm the worst looking one there. Yeah, well, why don't you go to the beauty shop and get a facial? That'll live you all day. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about clothes. After I finish with my housework, I work like a dog at the women's auxiliary. And I got to go there almost every day to attend a meeting. Well, I got $35 in my pocket that I got to pay our rent with. I can give you that to buy some clothes, but if you get the clothes, you ain't going to have no place to hang them. I know that much. Listen, George, I want to have some accessories or something. Other women have pocketbooks to match their shoes. Yeah, well, what do you want with crack, fat, and leather pocketbook now? Why, why do you want that? George, every woman likes clothes. Well, last summer I bought you a two-piece sport outfit. Two-piece sport outfit? What can I do with a pair of tennis shoes? Well, <laughs> oh, great for tennis, in case you get on a yacht and it does, sir. The only thing you bought me in the last year was a pair of flats that was eight inches too short for me. Well, they were supposed to be short. They was called peddlers. And I know the peddler you bought them from, too. Oh. Well, they don't use to argue, brother. You ain't going to buy nothing until I get more money coming in. I go into the office now and write to my congressman. Write your congressman? You've been written five times now. He ain't going to increase your unemployment check. No. Well, well, don't you buy nothing. If you do, it'll be over my dead body. And that wouldn't be a bad idea, neither. <laughs> Come in. Well, hello, Henry. How's uh, burned to a crisp? Is that so? What's the matter? Oh, me and the wife had an argument this morning. She wanted to buy some clothes and accessories and stuff, and I told her she couldn't do it. So I went back home a few minutes ago, and I found this package on the hall table. I opened it, and she done bought an alligator pocketbook. Oh, uh, the way women waste money, it's just a case of gross negligence. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's worse than that. I'd take it back to the store, but I don't know what store it comes from. But I ain't gonna let her keep it, I know that much. Yes, women's clothes is quite expensive. My wife went out and bought a pink satin slip for twelve dollars. Twelve dollars? Yes. Imagine spending twelve dollars for something that she's always afraid is gonna be showing. Uh, uh, you, you got trouble with your wife, too, huh? Oh, yes. She went out yesterday and bought a bathing suit for a ridiculous figure. Yeah, my wife's gonna lose her shape, too. I know where that is. <laughs> But I tell you what, I ain't gonna let my way disobey me and buy no pocketbook. Uh, what do you think this just thing's worth? Here, I'll unwrap it here. Take a look at the thing here. Well, when it comes to handbags, I'm no common sure. But if that's real, genuine alligator, it ought to be worth at least five dollars. Wait a minute, uh, our friend Andy's got a new gal that he met last week. I'll sell it to him so he can give it to his gal. I'll play safe and charge him seven bucks. <laughs> Come in, Ender. I got your phone call to drop over, Kingfish. What's up? Well, I uh, want to say goodbye to you, old boy. You ain't going to see much of me no more, Ender. Looks like I'm heading for Egypt. Egypt? Yeah, the River Nile, alligator country. <laughs> well, wait a minute, uh, you can swim in the Harlem River. There ain't no alligators in there. No, no, you don't understand, Ender. I is now an importer for the River Nile Alligator Pocketbook Company. Hmm. Offices in Harlem and Egypt. Uh, each year I spend six months in Egypt, six months here, and six months traveling. See, uh, uh, well, what kind of work are you going to do? Oh, importer for genuine alligator pocketbook. Well, I've got my first one in today. Oh, uh, yes, it's right here. Oh, gee, say, that's great. No, uh, brand new. Never been touched by human hands. Only the alligator hands can on there. Uh, you see, this pocketbook is the choice part of the skin. You only get one for alligator. It comes right off the stomach. Sure <laughs> You see, an alligator's got a pouch like a kangaroo, so you just cut the pouch off, put a zipper on it, and there you is. Well, tell me this, Kingfish. Uh, how much is it? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in nothing like this. This is the latest pocketbook. Uh, you ain't got no gal. You won't make crazy about nothing like that, is it? Well, now, the funny part of it is, I is. You don't mean to tell me. Uh, is she the wild animal type? Well, she got a leopard coat. <laughs> Well, uh, leopard and alligator get along fine. They're both dead. They're going to love each other. They ain't going to fight them. Uh, how much you want for it? Well, the Egyptian money, they sell for 12 and a half dromedaries apiece. Uh, but the price changes from minute to minute there, you see. Well, what do you think they sell for right now? Well, there's no way of telling. There's five hours difference in time over there, you see. The 
twelve and a half dromedaries apiece, huh? Yeah, of course, that's that whole beat of Suez Canal. <laughs> and, uh, then, of course, uh, the tariff, uh, then there's the import taxes and the custom duty is pretty heavy. But it just happens that the president of the company is over here now, just got in, uh, Prince Ally Ben Hogan. Uh, he, uh, he skipped all the taxes on it, you see. Uh, it just happened that he had this one in his turban. And he come by playing, he was a pound and a half overweight, and that's about 90 cents extra, that's all it is. Well, wait a minute. What is the price of the alligator bag the way it is now? Well, if you pick one up in the Suez Canal, it's five dollars. Ninety cents excess weight. Egypt tax sales is uh, thirty cents. Brings it up to seven dollars. Of course, the government though is asking us to be patriotic and make a ten percent slash, so that brings it to seven seventy. I'll let you have that. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to be patriotic, all right, uh, but I ain't got but five dollars. Well, don't say nothing in Egypt, though, just but you can have it for five. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, great, great, King Chris. Give me the bag. You know what I'm going to do? I'll give it to my gal's mama to give him good work. Yeah, well, if you ever drop over to Egypt, Andy, look me up. So long, old boy. Joyce, dear, what happened to that package that was on the hall table? Young woman, I was going to learn you a lesson. What you mean? I told you this morning that you couldn't buy nothing, so you went out here and went over my head and bought a genuine alligator bag. Now, you ain't going to get away with it. I done sold that alligator bag to Andy for $5. Now, let that be a lesson to you. You big dumber. That bag didn't belong to me. It belongs to Miss Williams upstairs. And there wasn't nobody in her apartment. And the little man asked me if he could leave it here for her. And a genuine alligator bag cost $50. Hold it, Matthew. I got to get that bag back from Andy before he finds out what it's worth. You get that bag back or I'll break every bone in your head. Oh, me. Trouble with my wife again. Always trouble with her. I ought to listen to my folks when I was young, because I remember my mama done told me when I was in New Spain. My mama done told me that she sang a woman who sweet talk and give you the big eyes. But when the sweet talk is done, a woman with two faced so right now, or worry something, who leave you to sing the blues? The blues in the night. Right. Now the rains are falling here, the rains are falling here. My mama done told me. Hear that lonesome whistle blowing across the desert of Louie. Yes, my mama done told me. A hooey, the hooey. Oh, clickety clacker, echoing back the blues. The blues in the night. Breathe and breathe, the stars that seem to cry in the moon. Smuggled in, 
And they want the names of the guilty customers that bought them. That's, that's what we're Well, now, wait a minute here. You was the one who sold me that alligator bag. You was the importer. I was the exporter. Well, it don't make no difference. You're porting it around from one place to the other, ain't you? <laughs> well, well, now, let us fill out the rest of the smuggling farm here, about you. Next line say prison. Name your preference. Name your preference there. Now, why don't you put on Alcatel, because when you get out, you can retire right in California. See what I mean? Well, when is that coming out? Uh, good note. Let's see. The next place might give you something to work on there. See here. Estimated age of man who purchased an alligator bag at the time of his release. Add 20 years to present age. Uh, <laughs> You know something, I ought to get out of town. I don't think you're going to have time to run away, Andy. I got it in the grapevine that the smuggling department makes the arrest in alphabetical order. And the fact that alligator starts with A, that puts you right top of the list, eh? <laughs> I want to tell you something, King Fish. If ever I get out of this thing, I ain't never going to buy nothing again unless it's made out of zebra. <laughs> well, now, look, man. Uh, you are a pretty good friend of mine. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You give me the bag. I'll give you the five dollars you done paid me for it. And I'll just tell the smoking deep on that I don't remember who I done sold the bag, but that's what I tell it. Oh, great. It's is you as a pal. I got the bag here in the drawer. Here's it. That's a pretty bag, too. Look at that. Well, hi there, fellas. Oh, hello, Amos. Hello. Come in. Close the door quick. Uh, Amos, uh, how about you coming back in about ten minutes? He's right in the middle of a big deal. Oh, it's you. I'll drop back. Say... That's yes, a good-looking bag you got there. Where'd you get it, Andy? It was smuggled into the country. Don't say nothing to nobody, though. Don't say a word. Uh, smuggled? Why would you smuggle it in? I'll uh, drop back in a couple of minutes, Amos, and I'll be ready to talk to you then. <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, I'll get the... Hey, that's an alligator bag, too, ain't it? Yeah, well... Uh, mind your own business, Amos. Now, Amos, he is in the middle of a personal business deal. Will you please get out? All right, I'll go. But you know, Andy, that bag looks like genuine alligator, and if it is... They're selling them in downtown here in New York for $50. Well, I don't want to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. I've always had my cards on the table, would you? But now I'm going to turn them face up so you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, that bag belongs to the woman that lives upstairs over us, and I've got to get it back to her. I don't believe that story, neither. I'm going to take the bag over and put it in my gal's mouth. <laughs> Mama's at home. This pocketbook will get me in solid. Hello there, Miss Adams. What you want around here, you lazy, no good bum? <laughs> Mrs. Adams, I brought you presents here. You dear boy. <laughs> Why, come right in. Yeah, thank you, thank you. A present for me? I must open it to see what's in it. Oh, yeah, I admire you, Mom. <laughs> you see, I never had a mama moan. I come from a very poor family. <laughs> oh, Andy, a lovely bag. Oh, it's nothing. Just a beautiful, expensive alligator pocketbook. <laughs> How can I ever repay you? Well, uh, I'll tell you how you can repay me, Mom. What a exquisite bag. Mom, dear, would you mention to your daughter that I ain't such a bad guy after all? Certainly I will, Andy. Huh. <laughs> and would you tell her that I am thoughtful and all that stuff? Of course I will, Andy. <laughs> uh, when are you going to tell her? As soon as she comes back from her honeymoon. She was married last night. <laughs> she was married last night to... Take your hand off that bag, you no good bum. <laughs> In other words, Andy, you don't give the bag to the girl's mama not knowing that the girl was married. Yeah. Now, if I can get the bag back, I'll sell it back to you for what I paid for it. Well, here's our lawyer, LaGuardia's office. Let's go in and see if he can tell us how to get the bag back. Yeah. Well, hello there, LaGuardia. Oh, uh, you got somebody in the office, huh? Uh, just, just, just a minute, boy. Just a minute. Uh, not later. Uh, you say you want the marriage or no? Yes, it's been a horrible mistake, and it took me ten years to find it out. Mm. Now, you, you ain't got nothing to worry about, because, you see, with me on the case, it'll be a cinch. I'll meet you in court tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Who is that? My wife. <laughs> and, uh, LaGuardia, you going to handle the 
kids, huh? Yeah, that girl is in a mess, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to be in the judge's chambers at 12 o'clock noon anyway. Yeah, what's going on there then? I'm getting married. <laughs> well, why are you getting married so soon again? Oh, you ought to see all the washing that's piled up at home. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you, you're going to get married for that reason. Now, we didn't mean to walk in on you while you were so busy. No, I'm going every minute now, there, yeah, but I'm busy all the time. A lot of crime going on, huh? I've got to go in court today on a second story case. A uh, second story case? Yeah, I had my client in court yesterday, and the judge didn't believe the story. I told him, so i got to pick up a second one then. <laughs> Well, now, listen, LaGuardia. Like I told you over the telephone, and to give the pocketbook to the gals, Mama, we won't get it back from her, because i got to give it to the woman that belongs to that lives upstairs over us. Yeah, well, listen, now, why don't you go over to the woman's house, Kingfish, play like you as a secret service agent, arrest Andy Brown as a smuggler right in front of the woman. He play all her sympathy. And maybe, through the goodness of her heart, she'll give the bag back to Andy and everybody be in the clear. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll go in the house first as the secret agent, you see? Yeah, now here, here's an old pair of handcuffs here that you can use. And, and take this old gun along. It ain't loaded. That client of mine used it as night to scare people with. You know, <laughs> you know Kingsley, this sounds like it's going to work. It's all right. Yeah, well, now, uh, uh, Andy, look here. After I get in there and I start talking to the woman... You come in about a minute or two later. Yeah. Now, I'll hide in the room somewhere. Then when you come in, I'll make the arrest and break the woman's heart. Yeah. Now, yeah. well, I, I got to hop in my car and take a trip tonight. See, I'm going up to sing, sing. Me and the father's getting out at midnight. Yeah. Midnight? Hmm? Ain't that kind of a funny time for the warden to let a prisoner out? The warden don't know he's leaving. <laughs> I hope this works. Good afternoon. Uh, I was looking for uh, Mrs. Adams. I'm Mrs. Adams. Won't you come in? Uh, thank you very much. I will. <clears throat> Mrs. Adams, I was here to tell you that one of the most dangerous criminals in the world is loose in this neighborhood. And we have been advised by our home office that he is on the way up here right now. Who is he? Who is that? I was with the FBI, the Federal Bureau of the Institution. That's who I was. Do you have credentials? Uh, credentials? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I got them, too. I got around here somewhere in a minute. Yeah, here, here, here's my card. There's nothing on the card. Yeah, you see, I was a secret service agent. You won't let us put a name on the thing. That's the <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, now, Miss Adams, uh, I was looking for a bad criminal, charged with smuggling. And this is an alligator case. Hmm, what's that got to do with me? Uh, tell me this. I want to ask you one question. Uh, you don't swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I'm going to ask you right now. Uh, did any man ever give you an alligator pocketbook? Mm, yes, I got one of the gifts from Mr. Brown. Brown. Not the B.R.O. brother then. Andy Brown. Andy Brown. I sure that's the name. Well, I ain't got my papers with us. You see, we burn everything when we go into action. That's what we do. Well, what about Mr. Brown? Mr. Adams, our office just got a tip on Mr. Brown. He's coming out here, and I got to hide behind your curtains and talk to him dead or alive. Dead or alive? Yes, we tried everything, but we find those two as the two best ways of doing it. And you're crazy. My head. Oh, yeah. Hey, wait a minute. That must be Smuggler Brown now. Yeah, yeah, listen, you go let him in, but don't say nothing. I'll hide behind the curtain here in the parlor, and then you bring him in here. Oh, my goodness. Hello, Miss Adams. Looks like the coast is clear. Come in, Andy. Yeah, I'll put on my shoes. You see, I don't want to leave no footprints no place. Won't you come into the parlor? Yeah. Excuse me, sir. I keep turning around, looking over my shoulder, but I was a little shy of FBI men. Great bunch of boys, but I have too smart for them. Come in, Andy. Uh, well, as I was saying, Miss Adams, there's a bunch of hot alligators that just got in town, and I want to tell you... Uh, reach for the I... ceiling, Brown. Your FBI is on the air. Hold it, hold it. Hold it, hold it, Miss Adams. Show me open windows, but don't lock... Don't move, Brown. Stand where you is, Brown, and don't take off those shoes. We got you. Oh, me, I was cornered. Oh, my goodness. Oh, take it easy, Miss Adams. I'll fix him so he can't do no damage. Let me get out my handcuffs here. I'll handcuff ourselves together, and in case he escapes, I'll escape with him. Yeah. <laughs> For goodness sake, get him handcuffed, quick. Well, first I'll snap the handcuff on my own wrist. And now the other one. Well, Brown, you was a pretty helpless guy, now. 
Excuse me, Chief, but you got both handcuffs on yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, excuse me, Miss Adams. Uh, we hold this gun a minute, Jeff. Oh, dear me. Revolver. Oh, don't worry. It ain't loaded. Oh, me. Uh, where's the key to these handcuffs? Uh, wait a minute, Chief. I think I got it here in my pocket. <laughs> this revolver frightens me. Well, it ain't loaded. Go ahead and pull the trigger. Hold him, hold him. That's a fine thing for the FBI to send me out with. It's a good... I got a good notion to write the J. It's a Hoover. That's what I'm going to do. Inspector, let's get out of here before we get shot. Well, yeah. What is this all about? Uh, Mr. Brown here is a very good friend of yours. Now, he done smuggled in the alligator bag that uh, he gave you. Now, uh, unless he gets it back, I send him to Alcatraz. That alligator bag, my friends tell me, is worth $50. And I'm not going to give it back unless I get the money to buy another one just like it. Now, look, Ms. Adams, uh, tell you what I'll do. I want to help this prisoner. He's got an honest face here. Uh... <laughs> I have got $40 that i got to pay my Secret Service rent with. Uh, uh, I'll loan it to Mr. Brown if you'll give him the alligator bag back. Well, all right, then. Give me the $40. Here's the bag. Thank you, Miss Adam. I feel awful about having to part with this bag. It's the prettiest alligator bag I ever seen. Someday I hope to own another one just like it. Well, now that Mr. Brown is free, maybe he can smuggle another one in for you. We'll work it out. <laughs> Honey, I finally got the alligator bag back, and I took it upstairs and gave it to Mrs. Williams' husband. Yes, and to think that you had to spend the rent money in order to get it back. Well, well, I'll get the door, honey. Well, Mrs. Williams. Hello, Miss Stevens. Yeah, I see you got your package that come for you this morning. I left it upstairs for you. Yes, thank you. Is anything wrong, Miss Williams? No, Sapphire. I'm here to tell you that for the good work you've been doing for the woman's auxiliary, we're all chipped in and bought you this alligator bag. Oh. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks written by Al Lewis. Well, it's always pleasant to welcome back a friend who's been away. That's why our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, was happy to be on her way to school a bit earlier than usual last Friday morning. Yes, last Friday, Mr. Boynton was due back from a biologist convention, which had lasted for three weeks. I had heard from him during his absence, of course. In fact, he sent me one passionate postcard after another. Two altogether. <laughs> but shy or not, a man is a man. Or as the French would say, c'est la vie, c'est l'amour which means a man is a man. <laughs> That's why I had Walter Denton pick me up so early last Friday. I hope we get to school before Mr. Boynton does, Walter. Oh, we will, Miss Brooks. This little old buggy will have you down to school in nothing flat. I'll settle for with nothing flat. <laughs> It'll feel rather strange seeing Mr. Boynton again. I wonder how he'll seem to me after being away so long. Oh, he probably hasn't changed any. Just a big, tall, dark-haired, good-looking guy with a sparkling smile and a throbbing voice. Yeah, who needs him? <laughs> he sure is attractive to girls. If it wasn't for the fact that she's so daffy in love with me, even Harriet Conklin would go for him. Harriet? But she's only a young girl. Is there an age limit? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> and I took Harriet to the movies last night. We saw Humphrey Bogart and Tokyo Joe. And after the picture, we both got the same thought at the same time. How much Mr. Boynton reminded us of Bogie. Mr. Boynton reminded you of Bogie? Well, sure, Miss Brooks. You see, in the picture, Bogie goes back to Japan after the war and finds out that the wife whom he thought was dead isn't. And boy, what he goes through to get that wife back. And that's what made us think of Mr. Boynton. What? He goes through almost as much not to get a wife. <laughs> Present company included. But I must admit I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Me too. In fact, I'm bringing him a little gift this morning. It was Harriet Conklin's idea. We were having lunch yesterday in the school cafeteria, and she suggested that we all show him how glad we are he's home in a concrete way. What are you getting him, a building? 
Oh, no, no, no. Now, we're all getting something different. Miss Enright happened to be at the table when Harriet mentioned it, and she got all excited about the idea. She would. Oh, I forgot. You're not overly fond of Miss Enright, are you? I've got nothing against her, Walter. She's a very good English teacher. She speaks very highly of you, Miss Brooks. In fact, just yesterday, she paid you a very nice compliment. Miss Enright did? Sure. She said you put even more effort into teaching than the job needed. And then she said she thought it was a miracle, considering how monotonous your existence is, that you don't look even grimmer than you do. (laughs) And to think, she never used to like me. (laughs) Of course, she does consider you quite a rival for Mr. Boynton's affections. That's why she'll probably get him some real expensive gift. Her parents are quite wealthy, you know. Yes, I know they are, but mine aren't. So as much as I'd like to get Mr. Boynton a little welcome home present, I'm afraid it's out of the question. Although I suppose I could cut off all my hair and sell it for enough money to buy him a nice watch chain. (laughs) No, he's probably pawned his watch to get me a new comb. (laughs) Hey, that makes a swell short story, Miss Book. Thanks. I'll submit it to old Henry in the morning. (laughs) Here's what I'm giving Mr. Boynton. It's right in this paper bag. Want to take a look at it? All right, Walter. Oh, it's a tie. Wow. Pretty loud, isn't it? It's a very original design, Miss Brooks. Tell me, what does it look like to you? Let's see. Well, to me, it looks like a big yellow tree on a cliff by the ocean with a purple owl on top of it playing a bugle. (laughs) That's exactly right, Miss Brooks. (laughs) Stretch Snodgrass gave it to me last Christmas. You see, I'm broke, too, and since I never had the gut... The courage to wear it. <laughs> See, I figured I might as well give it to Mr. Boynton. Gosh, I hope he has the good, the courage to wear it. <laughs> well, it is a fairly grotesque little number, Walter, but after all, it isn't the gift itself which matters. It's the spirit with which you foist it on someone. <laughs> Here's the biology lab, Miss Brooks. Shall we go in and welcome back our hero together? If our hero has arrived, it might be a nice idea, but first I... Oh, look who just came out of the lab. Miss Enright. Good morning, Walter. Hi, Miss Enright. And dear Miss Brooks, I hate to be the bearer of such evil tidings, but your quarry hasn't been sighted yet. My quarry? You were here when I arrived, remember? Well, I just wanted to leave a little welcome home gift to Mr. Boynton. I assure you I haven't spent two seconds hanging around this door. Oh, I'm sure you haven't, Miss Enright, but tell me one thing. Did you sleep with your paws over the threshold or under the threshold? Excuse me, ladies, but I'm going to leave my little gift on Mr. Boynton's desk, too. Well, Miss Brooks... I suppose you're waiting to deliver your humble little offering to Mr. Boynton in person. No, Miss Enright, to be perfectly honest with you. Please, Miss Brooks, it's a little early in the morning for fantasy. (laughs) Well, even if you were going to tell me that you haven't bought anything for Mr. Boynton, I assure you that your method of spreading the welcome mat is very effective. What do you mean? Well, you're wearing it, aren't you? (laughs) Really, I don't mean to criticize your get-up, my dear. I realize that on a teacher's salary, dressing well takes more than good taste, even if you had any. (laughs) I don't have to depend on my earnings to get along. Mama and Papa have always been extremely well off. They didn't know how well off till you were born. I'd better be on my way. I can't afford to engage in a common hair-pulling contest. Not when you get your hair at I.J. Fox, you can. <laughs> now, see here, Miss Enright. Let's... Well, I left my present on one of the lab tables so he doesn't miss it. See, that's a pretty big box you left on his desk, Miss Enright. What's in it? It's an imported suede jacket, Walter. And if you'll excuse me now, Miss Brooks, I'll let my gift make my welcome speech for me. I'm going to freshen up a bit. If I were you, darling, I'd do the same thing. If I were you, so would I. (laughs) Well, this is great. All I've got for Mr. Boynton's homecoming is a big, fat, empty handshake. Don't you believe it, Miss Brooks. I wouldn't let you be caught in a predicament like that. That's why I made out a card saying, To Philip Boynton from Constance Brooks, and put it in the bag with that tie I got from Stretch Snodgrass. That tie? Well, it was very considerate of you, Walter, but alongside of Miss Enright's jacket, that tie is bound to suffer. 
In fact, it looks like it's suffering by itself. <laughs> I did think of that, Miss Brooks. I'm sorry, Walter. I just can't accept your favor. Yeah, but Miss Brooks... I'm sorry. I've got to hurry into the lab and get that tie before Mr. Boynton lays eyes on it. I'd be embarrassed to death if he thought well, that I... Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. You're looking for me? Why, Mr. Boynton, I didn't know you were back. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, Walter. Uh, let's go into the lab, huh? Okay, Mr. Boynton. Uh, the lab? Not yet. Uh, don't you think you ought to say hello to our principal, Mr. Conklin? Oh, I just left his office. I brought him a little souvenir from the biologist convention. Oh, it was quite a meeting, Miss Brooks. Come on in the lab for a minute. I want to talk to you. Well, let's go in, Miss Brooks. Everything will be all right. Oh, but that tie with the owl. Oh, it's good to get back, all right. Same old blackboard, same lab tables, equipment, and... Say, well, what's this little bag? Open it, why don't you? Maybe it's a present from someone. A <laughs> uh, present? Oh, it's a tie. Ah! <laughs> what happened? Did the tree fall off the cliff? <laughs> Wait a minute. This is identical to the tie I gave Stretch Snodgrass last Christmas. You gave it to Stretch? It certainly gets around. <laughs> I, I remember it very well. I thought it was all right to give to a young kid, but... Uh... Oh, here's a card that came with it. Don't read it. Oh, that's okay, Miss Brooks. Well, let him read it. Hmm, it says to Philip Boynton from Daisy Enright. Daisy Enright? But look at that big box on your desk, Mr. Boynton. Why don't you go over and open this? But, uh, another package? What is this? Anyway, let's take a look at this situation. That's what I tried to tell you in the hall, Miss Brooks. I figured the tie would look like nothing next to Miss Enright's gift. So, I switched the cards. What? Well, this is a surprise. Oh, what a beautiful suede jacket. Miss Brooks, you shouldn't have done it. I didn't. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, I, uh, Walter here. I've got to go done. now. Still a little hard. Walter. 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 Well, Miss Brooks, well, this convinces me of something I've always felt to be true, that your sensibilities, your, your generous nature... Oh, look, Mr. Boynton, I just... Well, I'm just comparing this exquisite jacket with that ridiculous tie of Miss Enright. It's just, just overwhelming. You like the jacket, huh? <laughs> no, it's, it's the most wonderful gift I've ever received. Now, I did plan to stay home tonight and catch up on some work, but this, this lovely gift changes all that. Miss Brooks, I... Uh, if I may, well, I'd like a date tonight. You would? How about dinner, Mr. Boynton? Well, it's a splendid idea, Miss Brooks. What are you having at your house? <laughs> you, now. Oh, good. And, and let's have lunch together, too. Fine. The lunch will be on me. I wouldn't have it any other way. Me either. <laughs> well, there's the bell for class, Miss Brooks. Yes, I'd better get going, but Mr. Boynton, I'd appreciate it if you'd help me to the door. Help you? Yes. I want to be sure I don't trip over my conscience. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. E eminent dental authorities supervise hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate Dental Cream as directed, using Colgate exclusively, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research indicates decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst after meals or snacks. When you brush your teeth with Colgate right after eating, you help remove acids before they can harm enamel. Yes, Colgate contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. And remember, Colgate cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. Always use Colgate Dental Cream right after eating to help prevent new cavities, help stop tooth decay before it starts. Well, when lunchtime arrived, I hurried toward the cafeteria to keep my date with Mr. Boynton. But as I passed the principal's office, Mr. Conklin's daughter, Harriet, bounded toward me from behind a potted plant. Hi, Miss Brooks. Daddy wants to see you before you go to lunch. Naturally. But before you go in, I've got some wonderful news for you. 
What do you think I just found? Miss Enright lying at the foot of the stairway. <laughs> no. I've discovered the most devastating welcome home gift for Mr. Boynton. I got it in a store around the corner. Here, I'll open it for you. It's a hand-painted silk handkerchief, Miss Brooks. Look at it. Well, what does the pattern look like to you? To me, it looks like a big yellow tree on a cliff by the ocean with a purple owl on top of it playing a bugle. <laughs> That's exactly right. Isn't it the end? I hope so. <laughs> it was part of the set, but I couldn't afford the extra 65 cents for the tie that went with it. Don't let that worry you, Harriet. Maybe Mr. Boynton will just happen to have a tie with a yellow tree and an owl on it. And did you notice this, Miss Brooks? Right under the yellow tree on one of the green branches is the initial B. Get it? B for Boynton. Or billiards. <laughs> it's really very pretty, Harriet, and I'm sure Mr. Boynton will love every twig of it, but I'd better get in to see your father. Okay, Miss Brooks. See you in the cafeteria when you're finished with Daddy, or vice versa. Come in. Well, it's Miss Brooks. Sit down, won't you? Over here by my desk. That's where all my friends sit when they drop in to see me. You all right, Mr. Carson? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, Miss Brooks, I'm not all right at all. I'm very embarrassed. You see, this morning, Mr. Boynton presented me with a four-pound frog. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to call it? It's this brass ornament you see before you, and that's the crux of my embarrassment. You see, I had refused to join in my daughter's plan to purchase a gift for Boynton, but when he gave me this, this brass object, I told him I had a gift for him at my home. Well, it's not too late to pick it up, Mr. Conklin. But I have nothing for him at my home. Well, how do you think I can help you, Mr. Conklin? Uh, I find this most difficult to put into words, but although I don't believe in borrowing, I simply must purchase a gift for Boynton. And, Miss Brooks, as I've heard the student body put it, I'm stony. Mr. Conklin. Yes? You're still stony. <laughs> oh, and there's no sense in wasting each other's time. It's a good day, Miss Brooks. Good day, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Hiya, Miss Brooks. What's new in Inner Sanctum? Not very much, Walter. What have you got in those two paper bags? Well, in this one, I got the tie that Mr. Boynton thinks Miss Enright gave him. Owls on parade? Yeah. Mr. Boynton said he'd have no use for it, so he gave it to me. Of course, he warned me never to wear it when Miss Enright's around. If you're smart, you won't wear it when you're around. <laughs> but gosh, Miss Brooks, now I'm stuck without a gift for Mr. Boynton. Can you think of anything I could give him? Sure, but I don't think I'd fit in that bag. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're on the subject, have you seen Miss Enright around anywhere? Oh, no, Miss Brooks. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that she doesn't get to talk to Mr. Boynton. Me too. I'd better get him out of the cafeteria and over to Marty's malt shop for lunch. Are you going to eat now, Walter? Not just yet. I've got to deliver this sandwich to Mr. Conklin. That's what's in this other bag. Oh. He's eating in his office today. He says there's something in the cafeteria that makes him very nervous. I know. You pass the cashier on the way out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd better hurry now, Walter. See you later. Okay, Miss Brooks. Come in. Oh, you, Denton. Yes, sir. Here's your lunch. It came to 55 cents. Did it really? Yes, sir. I laid it out for you. That was very considerate, Denton, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait to be reimbursed. I, uh, I don't want to break a big bill. How big? Get out, boy. <laughs> uh, no, 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 wait, wait. What have you got in that other bag? It's just a necktie, Mr. Conklin. A necktie? Yeah, would you like to see it? I'll open the bag for no, you. Just I... hand it over. I'll open it myself. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's delightful. But frankly, Denton, I don't think it quite suits your personality. However, I might be persuaded to take it off your hands. Yes, indeed, I think I can put this tie to very good use. Well, sure, Mr. Conklin, I'll sell it to you real cheap. Oh, uh, I'm not interested in buying it, Denton, but perhaps we could work out a trade. A trade? Here on my desk is a beautiful brass frog. It's brand new, you see. I just took it out of this lovely maroon gift box. If you give me the tie, you may have this charming ornament. It's a deal, Mr. Conklin. Yes, indeed. I think I can put this frog to very good use. I'm glad I caught 
before you went home, Mr. Boynton. This is the first chance I've had to give you this little homecoming present. For another present? My goodness. I certainly appreciate this, Harriet. Not only because of the spirit behind it, but because it serves as a reminder that I ought to pick up a little gift for Miss Brooks. You see, I'm having dinner with her tonight. Oh, I think that's stupendous, Mr. Boynton. What are you going to get her? Nothing very ornate, I'm afraid. I spent quite a bit of money on my trip, you know. Oh, by the way, what's in this package you've given me? It's a hanky with your initial on it. A big B. Hmm, B for Brooks. I mean, Boynton. I had it gift wrapped for you, Mr. Boynton. But if you'd like to open it... Oh, now... no, no. Leave it wrapped. And, and thanks again, Harriet. Yes, indeed. I think I can put this hanky to very good use. <laughs> I think Mr. Boynton enjoyed the dinner, Connie. Oh, I'm sure he did, Mrs. Davis. Maybe you ought to go back into the living room, Mr. Boynton. I'll finish these dishes myself. I wouldn't dream of it, Mrs. Davis. I'll get my chance to be alone with Mr. Boynton later when you go to the movies. Oh. Am I going to the movies? <laughs> I saved up for it all day. <laughs> Very well, dear. But before I go, I'll make some coffee for the others. Others? I forgot to tell you, Connie. <laughs> Me and that absent mind of mine. <laughs> Mr. Conklin called late this afternoon and said he missed Mr. Boynton at school, so he'd drop over tonight with a little gift he had for him. Oh. That was right after Walter Denson called, and he said he'd be over with his little present. This is the earliest Christmas we've ever had. <laughs> now go on inside, Tommy. Forget the dishes. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. See you in a few minutes. Well, Miss Brooks, you all finished with the dishes? Mrs. Davis gave me time off for good behavior. <laughs> I, I don't want you to think I neglected to bring you a little memento of my recent trip. It's just that I, I was waiting for the propitious moment to present it to you, and, well, I, I think this is it. Here, Miss Brooks, I hope you like it. Why, Mr. Boynton, what a beautifully wrapped package. Oh, it's a shame to open it, but I'm so curious to find out what it is. So am I. Uh, that is, I... <laughs> I'm curious to see how you like it. I love it. <laughs> uh, may I may I see it, please? Surely. Here. Oh, thanks. I'll just... Ah! <laughs> you don't like it. Oh, I love it. You, you have no idea how difficult it was for me to get a handkerchief like this with a design to match the tie Miss Enright gave me this morning. Yeah, I don't know. I know I didn't seem too crazy about it at first, but it, it kind of grew on me. Look, it's initialed B for Brooks. Or bought by Harriet. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, if that tie grew on you so swiftly today, why did you palm it off on Walter Denton? Walter who? <laughs> well, uh, hadn't you better answer the front door, Miss Brooks? It's not locked. Come in. Oh, good evening, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton. Good evening, Mr. Conklin. I'm certainly glad to see you. He sure is. My, uh, my daughter Harriet told me you were having dinner here, Boynton, so I thought I'd drop over and present you with this little welcome home gift I promised this afternoon. Here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, shall I unwrap it now? If you wish. One thing about Osgood Conklin, he never stints on gifts. I bought this original creation in the most exclusive haberdashery in town. You don't like it. We love it. Always have. <laughs> what could be lovelier than a yellow tree with a purple owl playing a bugle? <laughs> Unless it was a purple tree with an orange pig playing a fife. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mr. Conklin. It's just what I needed. Oh, don't mention it, my boy. I still owe you a debt of gratitude for that lovely brass frog you gave me. I shall treasure it always. Come in. Good evening, folks. Harriet Conklin told me you'd be here, so... Oh, Mr. Conklin, what are you doing here? He just came over to give Mr. Boynton this gorgeous tie. See, Walter, with the tree and the owl? See, that's very... Oh, no. What are you all knowing about, Denton? Uh, Walter, did you say you had a gift for me? Oh, yes, Mr. Boynton. I got it right here in this maroon box. Oh, no. <laughs> knowing about, Mr. Conklin? Uh, Denton, I'd better have a word with you in the kitchen, boy. Oh, sure, Mr. Conklin. Just as soon as I give Mr. Boynton this brass frog. Brass frog? Brass frog. 
Brass frog. Well, thank you, Walter. It uh, certainly is fun exchanging gifts, isn't it? Yes, and tonight we're really exchanging them. Well, it's the idea that counts anyway, isn't it? And I've gotten some swell things, things that make me almost glad I left Madison so I could come back. Look, Mr. Conklin, how do you like this suede jacket I've got on? Oh, it's extremely attractive, Boynton. Miss Brooks gave me this. Come in. Well, good evening, everyone. Hello, Miss Enright. Miss Enright? Miss Enright. Miss Enright. <laughs> me I'd find you here, Mr. Boynton. Uh, she, she did? You remember Harriet, known to her intimates as the town crier? <laughs> oh, let me look at you, Mr. Boynton. My, that suede jacket looks simply divine. Ain't it a dandy? <laughs> uh, Miss Enright, why don't you and I go for a walk? It's pretty stuffy in here. Oh, but I just got here, darling. Let me admire my jacket for just a moment. Your jacket? Mr. Boynton, I better have a ticket with you, talk with you in the kitchen. <laughs> Gifts for you, Mr. Boynton, on your desk. My card was attached. Well, yes, I, I got the tie, Miss Enright. But... Tie? I didn't give you a tie. I gave you that suede jacket you're wearing. You? But, but the card said... <laughs> Miss Brooks, how did you... Miss Brooks, where are you? I'm over here in the closet with the rest of your gifts. <laughs> what are you doing in there? I'm using the hanky for a blindfold, the tie for a noose, and, Gridley, you may fire the brass frog when ready. Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, yes, tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Luster Cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I finally realized that there was nothing I could do but be completely honest and admit, in spite of what the consequences might be, that the entire affair was the fault of Walter Denton. Although the embarrassment was pretty evenly distributed, Mr. Boynton felt that the least he could do was see Miss Enright home. And Walter, of course, dropped Mr. Conklin like a hot potato. <laughs> when they had all gone, Mrs. Davis came in with six cups of coffee. Where did everybody go, Connie? Out, Mrs. Davis. Thanks just the same for the coffee, but I'm going to bed oh, now. Uh, just a minute, Connie. I have a little favor to ask of you. You know, everyone gave Mr. Boynton a welcome home gift today except me. Unfortunately, I'm a little short of funds, so I can't buy him anything. But if you don't mind... I'd like to iron that muffler you gave me last Christmas and give it to him in the morning. Please, Mrs. Davis, I've just... You know the one I mean, Connie. The one with the yellow tree on the cliff by the ocean. You're a little late, so good night, Mrs. Davis. Next week, turn into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Mustard Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palm Olive Shaving Cream comes both ways. And whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shave. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new palm olive way to shave described on the tube. 
And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get Tom Olive Brushless or Tom Olive Lather Shaving Cream today. October 24th is the anniversary of the United Nations Charter and will be observed by almost the entire civilized world. International cooperation is dependent upon you, individual citizens everywhere. The U.N. must have your support, faith, and enthusiasm. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting fun packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaks. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, the Raleigh Cigarette Program, starring Red Skelton with Ozzy Nelson and his orchestra, Harriet Hilliard, and Wonderful Smith. <laughs> Start the new year right. Switch to Raleigh cigarettes. Raleigh's are better cigarettes made with better tobaccos. And you can prove this all-important fact for yourself. Compare the open ends of a pack of Raleigh's with any other cigarettes. Yes, any others. You'll see the tobacco in Raleigh's is unmistakably more golden in color. And what does this mean? Any expert will tell you that golden tobaccos are choicer, more expensive. Yes, you can see for yourself that Raleigh's do give you the finer tobaccos. A blend of 31 of these more expensive golden tobaccos. And remember, Raleigh cigarettes give you valuable coupons, redeemable for over 70 luxury premiums, and for defense bonds and stamps. When you save Raleigh coupons for defense bonds and stamps, you help defend your country. With so very much to offer, friends, it's easy to understand why more and more smokers every day are switching to the pack with a coupon on the back. Raleigh Cigarettes. Nelson and his orchestra. And now we bring you the star of our show, Metro Golden Mayor's bright young comedian, Red Skelton. Thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Say, Truman, I really had a tough time hitchhiking downtown here tonight. Well, how did you get out here? Some soldiers gave me a ride. <laughs> yeah, I creeped in a Jeep with a fighting 69th. <laughs> Too tonight, you know. Say, uh, by the way, uh, Truman, did you have a nice Christmas? Oh, yes, Red, I did. And say, I sure want to thank you for the beautiful present you gave me. Oh, did you like it? Yeah. I've always wanted a bicycle pump. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, Red, did you like those shorts I gave you? Were they shorts? Sure. What'd you think they were? I thought they were slacks, and I wore them bowling last night. <laughs> Say, oh, hello, Harriet. Hi, Red. Say, I want to thank you for your lovely Christmas present. Oh, did you like them? Oh, yes. How did you ever think of putting initials on Kleenex? Oh. <laughs> I suppose you got other lovely presents. Oh, I'll say. Somebody sent me a perfume bookmark. Really? Mm-hmm. And now when my bookmark slips down and I lose my place, well, all I have to do is just smell along the edge of the book till I come to the right page. <laughs> oh. I smelled along the edge of a book once. <laughs> You did, Ozzy? Yeah, I did. Don't you hate those people who eat Limburger cheese when they read? Say, what did Red get you for Christmas, Ozzy? He got me a very expensive stick pin. It's an heirloom of a famous old American family. Well, how do you know? Well, the stick pin has his name stamped right on it. Wilkie. 
<laughs> Nothing. Say, what's the matter with you, Red? You're looking very sad. Well, a very unfortunate thing happened at my uncle's house on Christmas Day. They were having a party, and an awful fight started. Oh, was anybody hurt? Yes, my uncle was stoned to death with last year's fruitcake. <laughs> oh, how terrible. No, I'm just kidding. But he did have uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of drinks. I bet he had an awful hangover the next day. Yeah, and there was a little mix-up there, too. Well, there was? Yeah, my aunt mistook a little booklet called uh, How to Put Out an Incendiary Bomb for uh, a book on how to uh, cure a hangover. (laughs) And did my uncle get sore when she poured that bucket of sand in his face? (laughs) You have a great family, don't you, Ray? Yeah, I saw my brother Christmas, and he was very nice to me. He invited me over. He did? Yeah, he says, come up and see me sometime. We'll open a safe. Well, this is a wonderful time of year. Yeah. Say, maybe you can tell me. I'll tell you what. What are they going to have on New Year's Day in the Rose Bowl? Just roses. Johnny McCarthy loved Rosie O'Day. She was the prettiest thing. And every night in his sweet Irish way, under her window he'd sing, Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day. You're my philagadoosha, shinamarusha, baller, all the boom to the a Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day. You're my philagadusha, shinamarusha, baller, all the boom to the a. You're daring, you're darling, you're lovely. That's what I mean when I say. Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day. You're my philagadusha, shinamarusha, baller, all the boom to the boom to the boom to the boom to the a. And Moriarty Sudanahu, Mary Malone and the rest. They all want his favors, but what does he do? Sing to the one he loves best. Would you like to dance, Miss McKinney? Oh, sure, and I'd love it, Mr. O'Nelson. Let's go. Uh, Oh, I'm so sorry. Did I hurt your feet? Well, you did at the beginning, but they're numb now. Oh, go along with you. You're daring, you're darling, you're lovely. That's what I mean when I say... Rose O'Day, Rose O'Day. You're my philagadusha, shinamarusha, balder, all the boom to the boom to the boom to the boom to the That was Rosa Day, my <laughs> Sung by Harriet Hilliard and Ozzie Nelson. Ah, oh, sure, and Harriet, I wish I could have had a picture of you singing that beautiful song. Oh, I should have brought my camera along. Oh, have you got the camera bug, too? What do you mean? Well, you know, there's different t- types of photographers. Didn't you ever notice how different people have their pictures made? Nope, Red, I haven't paid much attention. Well, to start off with, we have a couple that goes to Coney Island and stops in those galleries along the boardwalk to have their picture taken. Harriet, you be Bim, and I'll be Bo. Hey, Bo, let's buy some cotton candy, huh? Yeah, you get it. I don't want any. Why, don't you like it? Yeah, I ate some cotton candy once. I ate it, I ate it, and I ate it. And when I got home, half of me underwear was missing. (laughs) Oh, look, hey, what do you say? Let's take a ride through the Tunnel of Love, huh? No, you ain't gonna get me in the Tunnel of Love again. No, why not? You always want a neck. Well, that's what it's for. Ah, uh, you're thinking of a Davenport. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hot dogs, hot dogs, get your hot dogs free. It's free. Yeah, uh, what's free, bub? A bun with every hot dog. <laughs> oh, look at both picture gallery. Yeah, do you want to have your picture taken? Step right in, folks. Three poses for a dame. Ah, that's a pretty girl. Yeah, how about me? Vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let me take your picture. And if they come out good, I'll send them to California. 
to my friend, the big director, Lloyd Steak. You mean Lloyd Bacon. Look, you eat what you like, and I'll eat what I like. <laughs> Take a picture. Okay. Come on, we'll pose right here. Let... Hey, what you hiding under that black cloth for, huh? I want to see how you look through the lens. Now I'll put the plate in. Yeah, I didn't think them was your teeth. <laughs> oh, boy, you're a killer. Too bad I don't have a lampshade for you to put on. Yeah, I guess you got a sense of humor, huh? You heard of Fibber McGee and Bill Thompson? Yeah. That's me all over. That's you all over. Yeah. Hey, what's that long tube with a bulb on the end of it? Listen, wise guy, you squirt water in me face. And I'll hit you on the head so hard that you'll have to unbutton your vest to see where you're going. Okay, okay. All right, folks, smile. Ooh, I forgot to tell you not to get excited, because I'm out of regular flash powder, so I'm using this gun powder instead. Oh, is that okay? Why do I look like a dope? Did you ever hear a TNT? Well, that's me all over. That's you all over. Ready? A one, a two, a three. Hey, where's the photographer? That's him all over. <laughs> then we have Clem, the fellow that lives way out in the country. Clem has the only camera in the community, and he's on his way to his girl's house to take more pictures. Well, this is where Daisy June lives. <laughs> Looks like her old man's home, too. Either that or he's got two suits of underwear. I'll just climb through the window. Well, how about that? Broke on both sides. <laughs> oh, you who? Daisy June. Big Feet is here. Hey, hello, Clem. How are you, Clem? Give me a great big kiss, Clem. No, oh, I better not. Your old man's watching me. How do you know? I can see the glint of his eye along the barrel of the gun. <laughs> Gee, you look pretty today. I sure like that pencil stripe dress you're wearing. It's not a pencil stripe. I tripped on a rake. <laughs> hey, do you like my new suit, Daisy June? Some fit, huh? Yeah, are those pants baggy or are you wearing a parachute? <laughs> Did you shave today, Clem? Yeah, I shave, but there's a shortage in steel for razor blades, you know. So I shave with a broken milk bottle. You, you did, Clem? Yep, yeah, and it was the first time I was ever shaved and pasteurized at the same time. <laughs> well, there certainly is a shortage of steel. The government even took away my bustle. You don't say. What they going to use it for, an airplane hanger? <laughs> Clem, mm. what do you say we sit down here on the Davenport? Okay, what do we do? Just sit here and look at each other, or don't you feel like laughing? <laughs> now, let's put some of them pictures that you took in the old family album, huh? Yeah, all right. I've always wanted to see that family album. Mm. Well, here's a picture of Aunt Minnie. She's an old maid, but she's crazy about the man. Yes. Yeah. yeah, on Christmas Eve, she thought she heard Santa Claus, and she met him halfway up the chimney. <laughs> you know... I have an aunt that's a little eccentric myself. She thinks she's Veronica Lake, but she's awful ugly. She's ugly and she thinks she's Veronica Lake? Yeah, she goes around with her ear combed down over one eye. <laughs> Damn, I'll bet you were ugly when you were very young. Well, I was, that's a fact. When I was born, the nurse said to my old man, Congratulations, we think it's a baby. <laughs> Say, Daisy June, I got some pictures here. What do you say we blow out the lights and develop them, huh? Okay, Clem. I'll, I'll blow out the lamp, huh? Okay. Daisy June! Daisy June! What are you doing with the lights out? Oh, it's Pop. Uh, we're developing film, Pop. Oh, that Clem is there, eh? Uh -oh. Where's the shotgun now, Pop Hill? Oh, I better get out of here. Don't mm. run, Clem. I bet you timbered. Oh, you. Yeah. Clem? Did I hit you? Oh, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> then we have a lady and her little boy. They're at home. <laughs> They're at home when a guy comes along with a camera and a pony. 
So, Harry, uh, Harriet, Harry, how do you like that? Harriet, you be my mother, and I'll be the little boy. <laughs> What are you doing now? I had shaving, and I had using pop to like we wager. Oh, don't be silly. What have you got to shave? The living room rug. <laughs> oh, Junior. I had a bad boy, ain't I, Mommy? Oh, you certainly are. Sometimes yeah. I'm sorry that we paid the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Junior, someone's at the door. Yeah, I will put a chair up against the door and see who it is. <clears throat> now I will peek through the little hole. What do you want? <laughs> My, what a tall little boy. Is there anyone at home? Yeah, who sent you, Joe? Now come <laughs> Is the lady of the house home? What did you tell him? Nothing. What do you collect him for? Not a thing. Who you got a warrant for? Nobody. And you got the wrong house, Bob. <laughs> now look, Sonny. You tell your mother that the pony man is here to take your picture. You got a pony? A real life pony? Oh, yes. And tell your mother you want your picture taken on the pony. Okay, okay. Now, don't go away. I'll be right back. Hey, Mummy, Mummy. What is it, my little orangutan? (laughs) Mummy, there's a man at the door with a pony. A real life pony. Well, if it's your father, tell him not to bring his friend in the house. (laughs) It ain't Pop, Mom. It's a man with a pony. And he wants to take my picture. Well, tell him I'm washing dishes. Tell him I'm sweeping the floor. Tell him I'm in the bathtub. You two is busy, ain't you, Ma? <laughs> oh, come on, Mommy. I want to see the pony. Oh, all right. Oh, but all I can tell him is no. Well, yeah, let me see the pony. Oh, there's a pony, man. And there is a little pony. <laughs> he is the one with the long ears. <laughs> Junior, get away from that pony. It's all right, Mommy. I just want to pat him on his nose. Ooh, he bit me. I will fix you. Junior, stop biting that pony. Okay, but it's the first meat I've tasted in weeks. Madam, would you like a picture of the child on a pony? I'd like a picture of him on a runaway horse. All right, Junior, now you come right in the house. Come okay. So I got my picture taken. Well, goodbye, pony. Goodbye, mister. I'm awful sorry my family is so cheap. <laughs> Now, it's not that, Junior. Your father can take your picture on a pony. Yeah, and it'll come out so blurred you can't tell who it is. Now, that can't be helped. That's your father's condition. Yeah, with him, everything's blurred. Junior, it's just that he's nearsighted. You mean he's (laughs) beersighted. See, I will never get my picture taken. I will never know how I look when I was a little fellow. I'll have to tell all my friends I never had a childhood. <laughs> oh, all right. I'll let the man take your picture. Okay, okay. Here now, Sonny, I'll sit you right up on his back. Oh, no, no. I had to fight. I had to fight. I had to hide over the ground. I had to hide. Oh, Junior, don't be silly. Your feet are almost touching the ground. <laughs> you do it little, any mom. <laughs> now, hold still while I take your picture. Okay. And don't do anything to make the pony nervous. Okay, I won't. He looked at me. I was sitting on a pony back. And I just found a great big pen. <laughs> if I do, I get a weapon. I do it. I will use the pen and go for a wipe. Mm. Hey, look, Mommy, I am fighting. Hi ho, aluminum. Hi ho, little player. I hold my fear, Quam. <laughs> uh, friends, stop me if I'm wrong, but I believe you'd rather have a beautiful bridge table in your living room than an advertising poster reminding you to buy a certain brand of cigarettes. And that's why Raleigh Cigarettes advertise to you with premiums. You see, the magnificent premiums you get with Raleigh coupons are a form of Raleigh cigarette advertising. These premiums are bought and paid for out of our profits, just as any other form of advertising. We have adopted this policy, this plan of spending our advertising money with you, so that you profit from each pack of Raleigh's you buy. You not only get a finer quality cigarette, 
made with the choicer, the more expensive gold and tobaccos, but in addition, you profit with bridge tables, silverware, electric clocks, and over 70 more luxurious Raleigh premiums. And in turn, we profit, because each time you see these magnificent premiums, you're pleasantly reminded over and over again that it pays in many ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. Frankly, we believe this is good advertising. Friends, think it over, and you'll agree, too. The next time, get the pack with a coupon on the back, Raleigh Cigarettes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in a poll conducted by Motion Picture Daily, Red Skelton was chosen by the radio editors of the United States and Canada as the outstanding new star for 1941. Leon A. Friedman, who represents the Quigley Publications on the coast, is here to present the award. Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Truman. Red, this justly deserved certificate reads as follows. Motion Picture Daily has the honor to present this award of achievement to Red Skelton, selected by the radio editors of the United States and Canada as the outstanding new star of 1941 in Fame's annual radio poll. Read in behalf of our publisher, Martin Quigley, and the radio editors, permit me to congratulate you. May you continue your most excellent work of bringing joy and laughter to a troubled world. Mr. Friedman, I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate the compliment you just paid me. I can only say thanks sincerely to your publisher, Mr. Quigley, and to the radio editors of the United States and Canada for having chosen me. played by Ozzie Nelson and his orchestra. Say, Harriet, did you ever notice a couple, a newly married couple having their pictures taken? Oh, yes. Let's do that one, Red. All right. As the scene opens, we find them in their car just leaving the chapel. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're married. <laughs> yep, we're married. Yeah. You think it's okay to hold hands now? <laughs> oh, gosh, Rodney, wasn't it a lovely ceremony? Mm. 
And there were so many people there. Yeah, I guess we got the overflow from Gloria Vanderbilt's wedding. <laughs> but we certainly had a lovely wedding. Yeah. Tell me, did anybody throw any old shoes? No, my head's always been lumpy. <laughs> oh, hey, look, there's something in the way. You better blow your horn. No, I'm afraid to blow my horn ever since. Ever since what? Ever since the finance company built a listening post. <laughs> Oh, look, here we are at the photographer. Yeah. Well, let's hurry upstairs to the photographer. This tight collar's killing me. Oh, there it went again. <laughs> Hello? Ruben Studio. You flash your pan with a flash pan. <laughs> no, Mr. Ruben can't take your picture today. There's something wrong with this camera. Every time he snaps it, a jab jumps out. <laughs> uh, pardon me. Oh, darn that collar. Uh, is the photographer in? Uh, he's busy right now. Oh. Hmm. Newlywed, huh? Yeah. Oh, we were here last night, but your boss was out. Uh, yes, ma'am. At night, we listen to the radio. There's nothing I like better than listening to the skeleton program. Sitting by the fireplace, shooting rubber bands in the fire. Doesn't that smell? You don't notice it with the program on. <laughs> I may have to give the award back, huh? <laughs> well, uh, is your boss, is your boss going to be much longer? No, my boss is not very busy. He's busy right now. But uh, I'll never forget the first time I got married. Oh. My wife says it was a wooden wedding. A wooden wedding? Yeah. Says she married a blockhead. <laughs> Good afternoon, good afternoon. Just married, I see. Yeah. Yes, we want to have some pictures made. Something in the comedy vein, or did you bring other clothes with you? <laughs> Are you going to stand there and let that man insult us? You want me to sit down, dear? <laughs> well, how would you like to pose, sitting or standing? Well, um, I want a background that will fit my personality. Oh, really, no. You don't want to pose with your head stuck out of a gopher hole, do you? <laughs> Will you hurry? We want to give our wedding pictures to our friends. That is the dirtiest trick you could pull on anyone. Ah, <laughs> uh, wonderful. Here, uh, you help take the picture. Take a look. I'll take a look right through the camera here and see how they look. Man, they look like a million dollars. Did you ever see a million dollars? No, sir. That's what I mean. They look like something I ain't never seen. <laughs> uh, tell me, do you think they'll photograph? Well, don't you think he ought to do something about them dark circles under his eye? Why? His nose looks like it's riding a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Say, will you hurry up? This is a rented suit, and this collar's choking me to death. <laughs> oh, there it goes again. Uh, Mr. Rubin, yeah. I, I think we ought to do something about this double exposure. I think we're going to get a double exposure because I used the same film four times. Yeah, eh? Well, look, develop it anyway. They're so gaga, they're bound to look good. Well, folks, just a minute and I'll have your picture ready. This is one of them new 30-second developers. <laughs> there you are. Uh, let's see the picture, please. <laughs> I, I, I won't pay for this, sir. It's a double exposure. What do you mean? Well, she's got two heads and I'm sitting on my own lap.
Ozzie Nelson and his orchestra are playing I Know That You Know. And we all know that most of those New Year's resolutions we're going to make are pretty easily broken. But here's one I think most of us will have little difficulty in keeping. That's right, Brad. Gentlemen, resolve right now to get more pleasure from pipe smoking. More all-around satisfaction. And you'll find all of that in Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh is better tobacco. It's made from a choicer blend of the finest selected Burley's grown, carefully cured and aged to give you smoothness, mildness, mellowness, and a rich nut-like flavor. And Sir Walter Raleigh burns even and cool with a pleasing, fragrant aroma. So, gentlemen, keep your resolution and keep Sir Walter Raleigh in your pipe. Tonight, try a tin of Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. <laughs> Skelton, with Ozzy Nelson and his orchestra, Harriet Hilliard, Wonderful Smith, and yours truly, Truman Bradley, will all be here again next Tuesday. We hope you'll be listening. Until next Tuesday, then, this is Red Skelton wishing you all a victorious New Year. And goodbye now, and thanks for listening. Red Skelton is heard on this program through the courtesy of the Metro Golden Mayor Studios. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. It's new. It's amazing. It's Prell. P-R-E-L-L. Prell Shampoo. Yes, Procter & Gamble's new radiant cream shampoo in the handy tube. Prell brings you the life of Riley. Prell, the shampoo that removes unsightly dandruff, leaves hair radiantly lovely, presents... The Life of Riley, with William Bendix as Riley. <laughs> Chester A. Riley is a good husband and a loving father. But there are some who think he should have been born a hundred years ago, judging by his stern Victorian attitude toward his 17-year-old daughter, Babs. Right now we find Babs tangling with her father on the subject of boyfriend. But, Daddy, why must you take that attitude? I'm not serious about Simon Vanderhofer. He, he's just a, a friend. So what harm is there if he visits my home? I'll tell you what harm it is. That Simon is a boy who... He's a boy who... Well, what? He's a boy. That's enough. <laughs> Besides, he's a lazy loafer. He'll never amount to anything. But, Daddy, Simon's only 22. 22. Do you realize that when I was 22, your mother was supporting me and a baby? <laughs> That is, I was supporting your mother. This Simon's a lazy good for nothing. Well, he is not. He's in business for himself. He sells bubble gum. Yeah, some business. A mouth-to-mouth -mouth salesman. <laughs> oh, Riley, I don't want to get into this battle, but you really ought to be fair, dear. Now, Simon seems like a nice boy, and he acts like a gentleman. Well, mother's right. Simon's not like all the other boys. He never tries to kiss a girl. On top of everything else, he's a dope, too. <laughs> the main thing is, I just don't like his face. Well, every man can't be good-looking. You ought to know that. Well, okay, so I'm one of the lucky ones. <laughs> I mean, because there's something that Simon's face... Well, it, it, it reminds me of a mean guy I used to work for back in Brooklyn. Skinflint Griffin, that was his name. Griffin? Yeah. Oh, the man who ran that candy factory? Yeah. What's he got to do with all this? That Griffin hounded me every day I worked in that candy factory. Three years I slaved for him... I was a chocolate milker. <laughs> so what? Uh, I never told you why that Griffin fired me. Daddy, what's all this to do with Simon? Griffin framed me. He accused me of drilling holes in five pounds of chocolate cherries and sucking out the syrup with a straw. <laughs> oh, forget it. Uh, then I tried to get a job in a licorice factory, but he called them up and blackballed me. <laughs> oh, I still don't see why I can't invite Simon over to my home for a purely intellectual evening. I told you, every time I look at Simon, I think of Griffin. And when I think of Griffin, I get mad at Simon. So don't you ever let me catch him in this house. But jeepers, Daddy. Yes, that's final. I have made up my head. Now, Simon, turn on that lamp 
and go home. I shouldn't have left you in the house in the first place. Now, please go. Very well, Barbara. I'll put on a light. The better to drink in your incredible beauty. But I want to go. I can't live without you. You're my everything. Simon, what's that popping noise? It's my bubble gun. It always does that when I'm excited. <laughs> Daddy will be here soon. Simon, you'll just have to go. All day long, all I do is think about you. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't work. And I like to eat and sleep. <laughs> Say you'll marry me, Barbara. I love you madly. I, mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. This is all so sudden. That's the way I am. I look like a big, quiet lake. But I got a terrific undertow. <laughs> Can't you see what I'm trying to say, Barbara? I love you madly. <laughs> I'm flattered, Simon, but I'm not in love with you. I, I just like you. But if my father catches you here, you'll... What has he got against me? Well, you see, Simon, it's your face. My face? Well, but your father doesn't have to look at me. I know how we can make him happy. We can sit in the dark. Simon, don't touch that lamp. You never acted this way before. I can't help myself. Just being near you sets me on fire. Simon? Let me put it another way. I love you madly. <laughs> it's no use, Simon. My father's got an idea that you're, well, not successful enough. Well, how can he say that? I'm ambitious. Only today I got a new sideline. I'm going to sell greeting cards. Greeting cards? You know, Easter greeting cards, also Christmas cards and New Year's, and wedding and birth announcements. Well, is there much money in that, Simon? Oh, I'll say there is. Would you like to be partners with me, Barbara? Gee, I could use some extra money. Things are pretty tough for Daddy, and I hate to always ask him for stuff. All right, Simon, I'll do it. Oh, that's wonderful. It'll be great, us working together. Why, if you'll go around with me, you'll see I'm no ordinary kid. I mean business. Well, we'll have to keep this a secret from my folks. They wouldn't like it. Well, we'll start selling cards tomorrow. Oh, I'm so happy I could pop. Oh, I'd like to get you on a slow boat to Flatbush. <laughs> oh, my father. Quick, Simon, hide. No, hide, hide. Where, where? Hey, Junior, Fred. There. No, we don't know here, behind the counter. Oh, all right. It's awful tight back here. Fancy, where? Oh. Oh, here you are, honey. Oh, oh Daddy. Hello. Uh, what's the matter, Babsy? Why are you acting so funny? Funny? Me? You alone? Well, why do you ask that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, anyway, I'm glad you ain't mad at me because I won't let you see that simple Simon. Believe me, I know best. <laughs> oh, Daddy, Simon's all right. Well, he might be okay, but I guess I'm just allergic to him. He reminds me of that mean boss I had. Then I get a tight feeling in my brain like any minute something's going to snap. Uh, you see? <laughs> Just talking about it, it happens. I... Wait a minute, that wasn't my brain that snapped. <laughs> that sounded like bubblegum. Dad, are you chewing bubblegum? Oh, oh, come in the kitchen, Daddy. I'll make you a cup of coffee. Wait a minute. Where there's bubblegum, there's that blowhard Simon. Where is he, Pam? Where is he? Oh, there I am, Mr. Riley, behind the couch. So, the minute my back is turned, you... Get out from behind there, you couch slouch. <laughs> Mr. Riley, if you'd only try to like me, I'm sure that you'd I find that I'll... Get out of this house. Yes, sir. I'm going. I'm oh. going. Goodbye, Barbara. Please mail me my hat. And stay out. I don't want my daughter going around with no 22-year-olds. And don't come back here till you're younger. Hiya, Ronnie. That you on the porch? Who's that? Oh, oh, it's you, Gillis. I was just out in the backyard to get these here logs for my fireplace. Well, what is that, eucalyptus logs? They don't burn nearly as good as oak. Yeah, I know, but I ain't got no choice. All you got in your backyard is eucalyptus. <laughs> They're my logs. Well, you've got a nerve, Gillis, helping yourself to my... Relax, Riley. We're next-door neighbors, ain't we? You're going to begrudge me making a little fire with your wood? Do I begrudge you smelling my smoke? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, Gillis. I, I guess I was hasty. I, I apologize. Okay, but next time, watch yourself. I don't like Budinsky's. Uh... Which, which brings me to another point. You made a big mistake with your daughter and Simon. Who says I made a big mistake? I do. I heard the whole thing while I was sitting on your porch. I can see the headlines already. Irate father drives daughter's boyfriends away. 
Lonely daughter leaves home. Uh, <laughs> go on. My babs ain't leaving home on account of a boyfriend. She loves her home. She wouldn't be the first. Poor homeless girls, defenseless, penniless, drifting lower and lower. Hiller, stop it. I can't stand it. If only their fathers hadn't been so cruel to them. I once knew a girl like that, alone, friendless, desperate. She got so she didn't even want to go on living. What happened to her? She married me. <laughs> but not every girl can be so lucky. Wait a minute, Gillis. I let Babs have boyfriends. Only that Simon, well, he's not good enough for my sweet bed. Get smart, Riley. If you chase Simon away, that'll only drive the two of them closer together. Why don't you be diplomatic? You mean hit him? <laughs> no, no, he's too little. I mean kill him off with kindness. Throw Babs and him together. All the time. If she sees too much of him, she'll get sick of him. Yeah. Say, that's a great idea. I'll fix it so she'll see nothing but Simon, Simon, Simon. Before I get through, Babs will be Simonized. <laughs> Daddy actually threw Simon out of the house. I was never so humiliated in all my life. Oh, that man. Why should he dislike Simon so? Sometimes I think you're Hello, not Dolphin. Hello, Babsy. Where is that sweet darling Simon? Now, don't tell me he's gone. You know very well he's gone. You made him go. I made him go? Now, what gave you that idea, Babs? Oh, don't try to deny it, Riley. Babs told me what happened. Your exact words were get out and stay out. And that's why he left? <laughs> well, she's oversensitive. Babs, you you got to have Simon over again some night. I love that boy like my own son. Riley, just what are you up to this time? You love Simon? Since when? Now, Peg, just because you don't like the boy, don't make me a party to it. What? I'm the type of father who don't butt in, as Babs very well knows. Well, I never... Daddy, you mean Simon can actually come here in the future? Who's talking about the future? We'll have him here tomorrow. What's the little angel's phone number? Here, have some more of this finish, Simon, darling. Well, okay, sir. That's good for you. Full of iron. I ate so much spinach when I was a boy that when I went out in the rain, I got rusty. <laughs> oh, Daddy. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Riley, it was wonderful of you to invite me. Well, that's the way I am, Simon. Wonderful. I want you to feel that this house is your home. Why, I may even give you a key. <laughs> oh, gee, that's swell, Mr. Riley. Uh, uh, Mr. Riley isn't really serious about the key, Simon. Oh, I guess that would be going a little too far. Why not just leave the front door open? <laughs> Father, and I thought your father didn't like me. Daddy's hard to understand sometimes. Not like you? Well, of course I like you, Simon. You're ambitious. You're starting small, but someday you'll be making your own chewing gum. And the name of Vander Hopper will be on the tip of everybody's tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But I was thinking of changing my name for business reasons. Vander Hopper is too long. Well, I don't know. I, I like it. Don't you, Babs? Babs Riley Vander Hopper. Musical, huh? Oh, Daddy. Originally, our family name was much longer. It was Van der Griffin Hopper. Well, yeah, that, that is a pretty long name, Van der Griffin. <laughs> what was that name again? Van der Griffin Hopper. Uh, Daddy, please pass the bread. Now, there were three brothers. My father changed it to Van der Hopper, another brother calls himself Hopper, and the third brother calls himself Griffin. Griffin? Yes, sir. He's in the candy business in Brooklyn. Candy business? Simon, have you seen any movies lately? Let's go and see one now. Oh, but he's a nice fellow, your Uncle Griffin. Oh, why, you love him. He tells the funniest stories. You know, once he discovered all the chocolate cherries had holes drilled in them, and somebody had sucked out the syrup. Right now. Uh, in the middle of dinner? I have no idea you were such a movie fan. Wait! Go on, Simon. You were saying somebody sucked out the syrup. Did your uncle tell you who? Yeah. There was some big baboon working for him. <laughs> oh, 
dear. Now I broke a plate. My uncle said this fellow should have been named Opium. He was such a dope. <laughs> we did, did he? Simon, get out of this house. Oh, oh, Daddy, please. Well, Mr. Riley, did I say something? Get out of this house. Oh, but why, Mr. Riley? I thought you loved me. The honeymoon is over. <laughs> Well, we'll bring you the second act of The Life of Riley in a moment. And now, here she is, the glamour girl of 49. I'm Tallulah the tube of frown, and I'll make your hair look swell. It'll shine, it'll glow so dandruff-free for radiant hair. Get a hold of me, Tallulah the tube of frown shampoo. Yes, folks, the little is right. Prell, Procter & Gamble's Radiant Cream Shampoo leaves hair radiant the very first time you use it. More radiant than any soap shampoo. And Prell removes unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes. Doctor's examinations proved it. For hair radiantly clean, radiantly lovely, try Prell the very next time you shampoo. <laughs> Before we hear more about Riley's feud with Simon, this is Ken Niles with a word about a wonderfully funny motion picture. Yes, The Life of Riley is finally coming to the screen as a universal international picture. You'll get a lot of pleasure in seeing all your favorite Life of Riley characters in this hilarious movie, starring Riley himself, William Bendix. Now, Prowl Shampoo brings you the second act of The Life of Riley. An hour after Riley threw Simon out, Bab slipped quietly out the back door carrying a suitcase. Simon was waiting, breathless with excitement. Together, they rushed off in the darkness. Where? Nobody knows. Oh, Simon, I'm sorry you taught me all of this. If Daddy finds out, he'll be furious. I don't care. I'm willing to take my chances, because I love you. Not so loud. Someone will hear you. Let the whole world hear me. I'll shout at the top of my voice. I love you madly. <laughs> How much farther is it? Here we are now. See the sign? Henry Stefanotti, Justice of the Peace. Come on, Barbara. Do you think he'll do it? Sure. He's going to make money out of it. Good evening, Judge. My name is Simon... Well, well, well. A handsome young man, a blushing young girl, little suitcase. I know what that means. Oh, oh no, no, you don't understand. We don't want to get married. You don't? Oh, but I thought when I saw the suitcase... Oh, that's full of samples of our greeting cards and wedding announcements. We're selling them. Here's my peddler's license. Oh, I see. Well, why do you come to me? Well, we thought that you marry a lot of couples. And they'll want to tell their friends about it. So we thought maybe you'd like to be our agent and take orders on commission. Oh, oh I see. Well, I'm always willing to make an extra buck. Uh, that, that is, I mean to help young people out. Uh, step into the parlor. <laughs> Oh, but you're so unreasonable, Riley. You can't throw a boy out of the house just like that. Just because you don't think he's good enough for your daughter. Why not? Didn't your father used to throw me out of the house just like that? Your father said I wasn't good enough for you. But in the end, I married you anyway. So what does that prove? It proves that sometimes a father can be right. <laughs> uh, 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 not your father. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't want to discuss it. But Riley... Oh, now, who can that be? Oh, good evening. Come in. Oh, is that me for you, dear? It is I, Digby O'Dell, the friendly undertaker. <laughs> well, sit down, Digger. You look tired. Did you have a hard day? Oh, yes. I covered a lot of ground. <laughs> I'm thinking of taking in a partner. The load is getting too heavy for one man to carry. <laughs> Well, you should try and relax during work, Digger. Take a few minutes off and stretch out somewhere. I don't dare. You see, I have a nearsighted assistant. Well, I've got my own problems, Digger. You know, being a father is no cinch. All I get is trouble, trouble, trouble. And it'll never end. Oh, yes, it will. Take my word for it. <laughs> but I grant you children are a problem. Take my daughter. Lily Fern? No. Pantagruel. The pretty one. 
the one who looks like me. <laughs> Poor child. No boyfriends call on her. They absolutely refuse to come to the house. Why? Who knows? You'd think we had a skeleton in our closet. <laughs> well, I got different headaches with my daughter. Babs has got boyfriends that I don't want her to have. So she saw her. She's in the room now, sulking. Oh, no. I just saw her on the boulevard with a young man. She? Out with a boy? Well, who, who is he? Sorry, I didn't recognize the body. <laughs> but as I passed them, I heard him proclaim, Barbara, I love you madly. <laughs> and crack his knuckles with a loud pop. That wasn't knuckles, that was bubblegum. She's out with Simon, and I forbode her to see him. <laughs> I don't blame you. This Simon is certainly no gentleman, letting your daughter carry that heavy suitcase. Uh, well, that's just like him to let Babs carry... carry... Uh, suitcase? What would Babs be doing out with Simon in a suitcase? Digger, they couldn't be. Oh, good heavens, Riley. They're eloping. Eloping? My little Babs. She's so young. That weasel Simon. Oh, you have... you have my sympathy, Riley. The boy's a cad. He should have his ears boxed. And I'm the one to do it. <laughs> Digger, I can't stand here. Peg, Peg, come here, quick. What is it, Riley? What's the matter? What is it? Dad's done a lot, Dave Simon. Dad? <laughs> Mr. Odell, what is he talking about? That Simon. When I get my hands on him, I'll... I'll... I'd better go. <laughs> but remember, Riley, if you require my help, just call for me. And if Simon requires it, no, in that case, I'll call for him. <laughs> Well, here you. I'd better be shoveling off. Riley, what's this all about? Now answer me. Digger saw Babs eloping with a suitcase. She was carrying Simon. <laughs> Babs eloping? Oh, I don't believe well, it. It's all my fault. I could have made her so happy. Instead of that, I made her get married. We're not sure she's married. Let's look in her room first. Maybe she left a note or something. Yeah, come on. Is anything going for clothes? I can't tell. She always leaves her room in such a mess. Peg, on her dresser, a note. Well, no, it, it's some kind of card. Huh? Oh, yeah, and it says, Peg, listen to this. To my bride-to-be. Today, my love, you'll be my wife and live within my heart. Together, we will go through life never more to part. Twenty-five cents. <laughs> I know it. They get married. This proves it. Married? Oh, no, I don't believe it. She's just a baby. Look, there's one of her little bobby socks on the floor. <laughs> Only this morning, some of her little toes was in it. And now it's empty. Riley, if Dad did do this, you're to blame. You drove her to us. Me? Well, I was only trying to protect her. Don't you know it's normal for a young girl to have boyfriends? It's... it's human nature. Well, that's what I was trying to protect her against, human nature. <laughs> I'm a failure as a father. My poor little bed. The phone. Maybe it's them calling from Niagara Falls. If that Simon tries to reverse the charges, I'll... I'll... Hello? Is Simon Vanda Hopper there? No, but I wish he was. Well, the girl who was with him left his phone number. Who is this? Tell him Mr. Stefanotti called. Who? Henry Stefanotti, Justice of the Peace. Justice of the Peace? Yes, they left their license here. License? Yes, and they'll need it. Tell them to pick it up. Goodbye. Hello. 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 That was the Justice of the Peace. They forgot their marriage license at his place. Oh. Oh, Riley. <laughs> Our little girl. Married. I'll put an end to that marriage. I'll tear up the license. I'll take that Simon and have him a note. Oh. <laughs> now, now, let's be calm. Let's talk to them first, and, and Simon can... No, I just... Listen, somebody's coming. Quiet, Peg. Gee, Babs, I hope your father isn't home. I don't think he is. I don't see his shoes on the piano. <laughs> it's them. When I lay my hands on Riley, him, I... I forbid you to hit him. Promise. Please, just one little punch in the nose. <laughs> After all, he's my son-in-law. <laughs> no. Now, it's better if we discuss it quietly. Yeah, well, okay. Maybe you're right. I'll hide the good case in the... Oh, Daddy! Ah, good night, Bab. Just a minute, Simon. Riley, please. Uh, well, just a minute, son. Don't go yet. Sit down. Yes, sir. Well, 
Daddy, Simon and I... Now, please don't get upset, but we went and... Yes, I know all about it. I found this card, and I spoke to that justice of the peace. Oh, Simon, he knows. Mr. Riley, you're not angry. Why shouldn't I be? But, Daddy, it's only temporary. It's only till Easter. <laughs> Easter? Easter nothing. I'm calling it off right now. But we can't call it off. We've already ordered the baby announcement. <laughs> Oh, oh, my heaven. Yes, sir. I don't let the grass go on the my feet. <laughs> Baby, but you were just married. Married? Married? Who, us? What are you talking about, Daddy? We're just selling greeting cards and wedding and birth announcements. But... But the justice of the peace and the license. That's just a peddler's license. Oh... Oh, Riley. Oh, and we thought... Oh. Gee, I wish Barbara would marry me. I love her madly. Babs, you mean you and Simon didn't get married? Why, Daddy, of course not. I'm still single. What a revolting development this is. <laughs> The Rileys will return in just a moment. When you want your hair to look its radiant best, does soap film and unsightly dandruff spoil its appearance? Then do as millions do. Shampoo with Prell, Procter & Gamble's radiant cream shampoo. Because Prell removes embarrassing dandruff in as little as three minutes. Doctors' examinations proved it. And even in hardest water, Prell leaves hair more radiant than any other leading cream shampoo. With no dulling soap film. And Prell's economical goes farther than any known shampoo because it's more concentrated. Try Prell yourself. As Tallulah says, I'm Tallulah the tube of Prell, and I'll make your hair look swell. It'll shine, it'll glow so dandruff-free for radiant hair. Get a hold of me, Tallulah the tube of Prell Shampoo. Yeah. What's that with you? Oh, that's a box of Griffin's chocolate cherries that Simon sent to bed. Yes. Yeah. You didn't take any. Oh, uh, no, no. No, no, no. I, 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 I didn't touch them. Oh, they, they do look tasty. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think there'd be any harm in trying just one. Oh, no, 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 Peggy. You mustn't mm. touch them. Mmm, they're delicious. Oh, that's funny. There's no syrup inside. <laughs> And there's a tiny hole in each chocolate. Riley. I'm innocent, I swear. I didn't do it. Must have been a woodpecker. I swear I'm innocent. Parker and Gamble invite you to join us again next week to hear The Life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. William Bendix will soon be seen as the star of the motion picture, The Life of Riley. Mrs. Riley is Paula Winslow, Digger O'Dell is John Brown, and Babs is Barbara Eiler. The Life of Riley is produced by Irving Brecker. And remember, for more radiant hair free of unsightly dandruff, get the shampoo in the tube. P-R-E-L-L, Prell Shampoo. <laughs> Now I know why they call it a wonderful soap for dishwashing. It's ivory mild. It's speedy. It's... Yes, of course. It's wonderful ivory snow. And, lady, you can prove that it's wonderful for dishwashing. Your hands will tell you why. Just try ivory snow in your dishpan. When you see how ivory snow pampers your hands, you'll be delighted. It's ivory mild, ivory pure. And ivory snow is granulated to give you speed, too. There's no soap made that's faster for dishes or kinder to hands than Ivory Snow, the only soap both Ivory Mild and granulated for efficiency. There's no other soap like it. For speedier dishwashing for snow-white hands, try. 
Wonderful Ivory Snow. And this is Ken Niles reminding you to tune this NBC station every Friday night for Jimmy Durante, Eddie Cantor, Red Skelton, and The Life of Riley. Goodbye. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.